Well, hello there, and welcome to the old Pick 6 Movies Garage. What? You've never been here? Well, let me show you around. Mind the oil. What we do here is my lifelong pal, Chad Cooper, and I, Bo Ransdell, come up with a general idea, a theme, if you will, and then we pick six movies that fit that theme. Hey, that's the title of the show, right in the description. And that's just the kind of Oscar Wilde-esque wordplay you can expect. Also, the unexpected. And unexpected indeed is this season's theme, Hot Wheels. Six movies all about the gas-guzzling, highway-chewing cars that made this country great. And next on our list is episode three, Gone in 60 Seconds. A remake of a surprisingly good movie, and a genuine grade-A blockbuster produced by Jerry Bruckheimer and starring Nicolas Cage. But first, Chad's gonna spin a little yarn about the movie, and I'll be back after to rip this bucket of bolts a new one. So, ladies and gentlemen, away we go! H.B. Halicki was born on October 18th, 1940 in Dunkirk, New York on the shore of Lake Erie and he was one of 11 children. After the first 15 years of his life, his family packed up their bags to escape the winters of Great Lakes living, and they moved the family to sunny Southern California. Halicki showed an early interest in all things automotive, but his mother refused to let him get his driver's license once he was of age. So since he couldn't legally drive in a car, he did the next best thing. He pumped gas into a car. Actually, a lot of cars, because he got a job working at a gas station. Halicki pursued his passion of all things automotive, and he went on to open up his own garage and wrecking yard in Gardena, California. And his business was doing pretty well. The business started doing really well when in 1968, at the age of 28, Halicki and three other men, allegedly, started an auto theft ring that targeted late model cars from the greater Los Angeles and San Francisco International Airports. According to police records, the crew, allegedly, bought cars from salvage yards that were all manner of busted up, and then they would go and steal that car's identical twin. These enterprising young businessmen would swap out stolen parts from the old busted cars with good parts from the new cars that they acquired. Then they would resell the old busted cars that now look good as new as being, well, new. The cops got wise to this outfit's modus operandi, and investigators started digging in and turning the screws on all the members of the car theft ring of no goodniks. And when all the dust kind of settled, somehow all the charges against Halicki were dropped. And so it was that Halicki, seeing the error of his ways, decided to associate himself with a better class of professionals, known for their high morals and upstanding citizenry within the community at large. I'm talking about Hollywood movie makers. Halicki's crooked path of life was now on the straight and narrow and landed him soundly in Southern California in the early 1970s. And like so many starry-eyed young hopefuls of that era, he wanted to fulfill his dream of making a major motion picture. And so it was that Halicki began getting his hands on, I mean, legally purchasing all kinds of cars at auctions around Southern California. And in total, he nabbed, ethically acquired, more than 200 automobiles in total. And not just regular old cars, like the ones you and I drive. He got police cars and fire engines and garbage trucks and all kinds of road legal vehicles that he wanted to use in his movie. Most of these cars and trucks were bought for about 200 bucks each, and they were parked on a lot until the movie was to begin production in 1973. Now, the movie actually began production on a fateful day when Halicki heard about a train derailment nearby and thought, hey, that would be a great opening for my movie. So he rounded up his, let's call them film crew, and they grabbed their equipment and they headed to the site of this train wreck. Once they got there, Halicki and his team somehow convinced the NTSB and other authorities to let them film a quick improv scene, which is what they did. And with that scene in the can, the movie needed a plot and it needed characters and story structure and editing and maybe some drama or some suspense or a little conflict, maybe a dash of pathos. You know what? I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here. In true guerrilla filmmaking style, Halicki used whatever he had readily available to be part of his movie. There are fire trucks that appear in his film that were actual Long Beach fire trucks on their way to a real emergency. Halicki just told his camera crew, film those trucks. We'll see if we can find a place for them in the movie. 
Now, I know what you're thinking. Why wouldn't the filmmakers just read the script to see if there was a scene calling for fire trucks? Well, there was one small problem. The movie had no script, just some vague outlines for dialogue. Most of the acting and all of the words spoken were pretty much improvised by the cast, and the crew kind of made things up as they went along. Halicki had no studio backing for the film, and therefore, comparatively, he had no real budget with which to make his film. He had no actors for his movie, so Halicki cast himself to play his lead character, Mandrian Pace. Additionally, Halicki, a man who was not trained in any sort of stunt work, decided he was going to do all of his own stunts. Halicki rounded up all of his friends and his family to be in the movie because he had no money to pay real actors. Most of the characters in the film that portray EMTs or police officers or firefighters, well, they were in fact real life EMTs and police officers and firefighters. The majority of the bystanders in the movie are just the general public going about their day-to-day -day business. And in the film, it shows. This use of the public as background characters caused several incidents where the general public assumed that real police officers were performing real police pursuits, and often the public tried to help the victims of some of these crashes and crimes. In one scene, two cars collided, and a random pedestrian started shouting in disgust as fake police officers officers sped by in their patrol cars, not stopping to help the fake victims of this real crash. During one scene at night at a gas station, a driver is pulled out of his car by the cops. They're all, let's call them actors. And at this point, a real biker gang that happened to be getting drunk and looking for a fight with cannonballers across the street came over and just started verbally abusing the fake acting police officers who were arresting this fake actor of a driver. The whole thing began to mesh reality and, and fiction into this mismatch of complete and total cinematic chaos. Halicki even got the mayor of Carson, California, Saki Yamamoto, to appear in the film. But my guess is that Mayor Yamamoto may not have even known he was playing a character in this movie until he saw the finished product in theaters. Speaking of characters in the movie, let's talk about the characters. Well, let's talk about one particular character. Our movie's main hero, Mandrian Pace, an insurance investigator who has a team that all lead double lives as unstoppable car thieves. Now, the plot of our movie, in as much as there is one, involves maybe a South American drug lord who pays our hero and his team to steal 48 cars in exchange for $400,000. And the crew, over the course of the movie's mm, first 40-ish minutes, they managed to get their hands on 47 of the 48 cars, leaving a 1973 yellow Ford Mustang still outstanding, affectionately nicknamed Eleanor. Our hero spies the elusive Eleanor, and he goes to steal the final car, but he doesn't know that the cops were tipped off to their plan, which leads to the movie's final car chase through five different cities, lasting a full 40 minutes long. And that's pretty much the whole movie. And it is awesome. According to people who take time to count this sort of thing, the frantic four-wheeled 40-minute finale features the destruction of 93 cars in the movie's high-speed final act, and a total of 127 cars were either destroyed or damaged during the movie from start to finish. With a notable absence of safety oversight and a clear disregard for the well-being of men, women, and children, you probably think that this type of production would produce a long list of accidents associated with bringing a movie like this to the silver screen. And you'd be right. One particular scene, filmed at a construction site, we find a patrol car that goes up the side of a hill and flips over. And none of that was really planned, and nor was the fact that the driver was almost crushed and killed as the car collapsed upon itself as it rolled over. You can see that near-death encounter in the finished movie. J.C. Agajanian Jr., who plays a detective in the roadblock sequence at Terrence Mazda Agency, well, he was almost killed when Halaki missed his mark and he hit one of the unmarked Plymouth patrol cars, sending it careening towards Agajanian, who was only missed due to his quick reflexes and dumb luck. You can see that near-death encounter in the finished film as well. During the filming of the movie, Halicki himself suffered multiple injuries, one of which was when he was driving the highly sought after Eleanor, the yellow Mustang. It got clipped by a pursuing car, which sent the Mustang into a metal light pole at 100 miles per hour, knocking Halicki, remember, the film's writer, director, producer, stuntman, and star, completely unconscious. Holy shit. 
According to people on the set, Halicki, after regaining consciousness, asked, did we get coverage? The balls on this guy. When you watch the movie and you see Eleanor smash into the light pole, you actually hear a guy, again, I can't say in good faith that he's an actor, but someone who's playing a detective in a different patrol car, he sticks his head out of the passenger side window and says, he just hit a damned light pole. This is more cinema verte than it is improvised shtick. The scene immediately following that crash, the one that almost killed the movie's everything, well, it was actually shot three weeks later when Halicki showed up wearing a full leg cast. He had several broken ribs to complete filming the sequence. But that's not all. In the movie's finale, Halicki and Eleanor roar down the street, they hit a ramp, and they launch a good 30 feet into the air over a bunch of cars, and they smash down onto the ground below. This stunt caused Halicki's vertebrae to violently compress down on one another, preventing Halicki from ever walking the same again. And you know what? If I pulled off a stunt like that, I wouldn't walk anymore. I'd strut my ass everywhere I went. Mark Twain said it best. You write what you know. And that's what Halicki did. He wrote, well, he wrote an outline at least, of a movie about a team of guys that steal cars. And it's no surprise that Halicki's alleged airport car theft ring really resembled the M.O. of the car thieves depicted in Halicki's first feature film. And I'm speaking, of course, about the 1974 classic, Gone in 60 Seconds. But what is a surprise was that the movie ended up raking in over $40 million during its original theatrical release on a budget of $150,000. And that $40 million didn't even include the re-releases and international dollars and the home video market. A lot of interest in Halicki's film was bolstered by the success of other popular car chase movies, including the 1968 film Bullet starring Steve McQueen and the 1971 Gene Hackman vehicle, T. The French Connection. But those movies were real movies, with real budgets, with real actors. They had safety standards, and they had trained stunt people. Gone in 60 Seconds hit theaters, and people went bonkers watching this high-speed, shoestring, crash-and-smash movie that was like a demolition derby on steroids up on the big silver screen. The success of Gone in 60 Seconds and other high-speed car stunt movies really paved the way for the success of future films such as Smokey and the Bandit, See Season 1, Episode 1 of Pick 6 Movies, as well as the hit TV show The Dukes of Hazard. The success of Gone in 60 Seconds also allowed Halicki to make two more car chase movies, The Junk Man in 1982 and Deadline Auto Theft a year later in 1983. But neither was really as successful as the original Gone in 60 Seconds. The same year that Deadline Auto Theft was released, Halicki met his wife, Denise Shakarian, and the two of them decided that they would make a sequel to Gone in 60 Seconds, where they would both star in the movie together. The name of the sequel would be Gone in 60 Seconds 2. Now, the sequel was going to be bigger and faster and louder and crashier and more intense than the original film. And it was outlined that the plot wasn't going to have anything to do with the original movie. Why would it? This time, Halicki bought over 400 automobiles that he was going to destroy in the film, which would feature all new and improved car chases and a brand new plot. Hmm, plot, that's a strong word. Let's call it a storyline. And so filming began. And on August 20th, 1989, Halicki was shooting a stunt for the film in Tonawanda, New York, where a water tower was rigged for the stunt, where the water tower would fall during, what else, a car chase. But during filming, the rigging on the water tower for the stunt failed, which caused a cable to snap, which knocked over a telephone pole, which fell on Halicki, which killed him? Oh my God. In 1992, Halicki's warehouse of cars and all the toys that he had bought over the years, well, they were auctioned off to pay his debts to the people that had invested in the sequel to Gone in 60 Seconds. His collection of stuff included over 100,000 pieces that were sold, and the auction attracted about 5,000 people. The widow Halicki ended up with a cash settlement. She got their home, and she also got the rights to Halicki's three films. And when you have the rights to a movie, you own the rights to any potential remakes. Gentlemen... Start your engines. Offers began rolling in from Hollywood to remake Gone in 60 Seconds, and it was decided that Michael Linton, the head of Disney Studios, who was a big fan of Halicki's work, along with every other 12-year-old boy everywhere, well, he was going to bring a reboot to the big screen. Jerry Bruckheimer, producer of movies where things crash and explode, was brought in to produce the film. Dominic Senna came on board to direct the film. Senna had a lengthy career directing music videos for Janet Jackson, Sting, Tina Turner, Janet Jackson, 
Richard Marks, Michael Bolton, Janet Jackson, Janet Jackson. Man, there's a lot of Janet Jackson in there. Cinna's career of generating content for MTV and more to the point VH1 in the late 80s and 90s led Cinna to direct his first feature film, California spelled with a K. This was a cross-country road trip movie where David Duchovny escorted Brad Pitt, lots of handsome in there, and Pitt's wife Juliette Lewis across the country with Pitt playing a redneck serial killer. I saw the movie back in the day and I remember it being pretty entertaining. Based on the success of that film, Cena climbed into the driver's seat of the Gone in 60 Seconds reboot. After this movie, he ended up directing Swordfish with John Travolta and Hugh Jackman and Halle Berry and Halle Berry's naked breasts. Stepping in front of the camera was not one Academy Award winner, not two Academy Award winners, but three Academy Award winning thespians. Playing the hero of our movie would be Nicolas Cage, who was fresh off receiving his Oscar statuette for his performance as a self-destructive alcoholic in Leaving Las Vegas. Alongside Nicolas Cage would be Angelina Jolie, who took home her Oscar for her performance in Girl Interrupted. And rounding out the trio of Academy Award winning performers was none other than Robert Duvall himself, who won for Best Actor in 1984's Tender Mercies. But he should have gotten an Oscar for The Godfather back in 73. He was robbed. And the rest of the supporting cast in this film is really a notch above as well. Timothy Oliphant, who would later go on to play U.S. Marshal Raylan Givens in the FX series Justify, he's in this movie, and no Alex, I haven't watched that series yet. Giovanni Ravisi, who was in Saving Private Ryan and would later go on to play the bad guy, Peter Selfridge, in Avatar, and is also slated to appear in the ever-elusive Avatar 2, Avatar 3, Avatar 4, and Avatar 5. Man, that is a lot from Avatar in there. The movie also stars its own Eleanor, a DuPont Pepper Gray 1967 Ford Mustang Fastback, depicted as a Shelby GT500 with a custom body kit. There were 12 Fastback Mustangs built and dressed up to look like Eleanor, and each one was designed to perform different stunts. Some were meant to survive jumps, some were meant for high-speed maneuvers, and one had higher gearing for the blast over the LA River. Now, of those 12, only seven survived the torture of being stunt cars in the film. The script of the remake didn't really follow the original movie's plot because, well, as noted earlier, the original film really didn't have a plot. And you know what? We're going to wait for Bo to get here before we start discussing the ins and outs of what happens in this movie. Spoilers, cars go fast, they crash, and some explode. Now, one thing that the remake did have in common with the original were last minute improvisations, especially when it came to the movie's final chase scene. This proved challenging for stunt coordinators as shooting requirements often change from day to day and hour to hour. During filming, the Vincent Thomas Bridge, which spans the Los Angeles Harbor, was actually closed down for an entire day of filming. And at the time of this recording, it's the only time in history where the bridge was actually shut down to the public. To prepare for the lead role in this movie, Nicolas Cage attended the Bondurant Driving School in Phoenix, Arizona, and he actually did quite a bit of driving in the film. There are scenes in the movie where a sharp eye can actually catch Nicolas Cage driving Eleanor, performing 180 degree spins and power slides through LA traffic. Can you imagine Nicolas Cage doing something crazy like that? Actually attending driving school before performing power slides? That is truly unexpected behavior from a man whose very essence exudes a confident aura of, don't worry, I've got this. Gone in 60 Seconds came out on June 9th in the year 2000, and it was tops at the box office, knocking Mission Impossible 2 down to the number two spot from its prior week debut in number one. It also pushed down the Martin Lawrence comedy Big Mama's House to third place. <laughs> oh, Big Mama's House. The movie ended up making around $237 million worldwide, with about 100 of that coming from U.S. audiences. But according to a report in Slate Magazine, the movie cost a little over $100 million to make and another $90 million to market, along with other expenses. So that worldwide haul ended up being, well, less than the original movie netted out in revenue. Oddly enough, film critics loved the movie. I'm kidding. Most of them hated it or were completely indifferent. Go-to movie critic and gravy aficionado Roger Ebert said of the film, Movies like this are what they are. Gone in 60 Seconds is a prodigious use of money and human effort to make a movie of no significance whatsoever in which the talents of the artist are subordinated to the requirements of the craftsman. 
witnessing it, you get some thrills, some chuckles, a few good one-liners, and after 119 minutes, are regurgitated into the theater, not much worse for the wear. Prodigious? Subordinated? Requirements of the craftsman? What movie was he watching? This movie wasn't meant for Francis Film Critic. It was meant for Joe Sixpack. You know what? Let's take a look at some random IMDb review. IVO Cobra 8 said of the movie, quote, Gone in 60 Seconds is my favorite action heist film of a cars and a car thief. Angelina Jolie in this film is fantastic. I seriously love her so much. I love her character. This is one of my favorite Nicolas Cage films and my favorite films about cars, along with The Fast and the Furious. Don't expect a bulletproof plot, but the cars and the action complement a surprising, captivating storyline. IBO Cobra 8 goes on to say, quote, This movie is downright one of the best movies I've ever seen. If you like fast cars, you will love this awesome movie. A lot of people hate this film. I don't. I love it. How do you argue with that? You know what? And really, at the end of the day, who's to say if this movie is any good or any bad? Well, heck, I can answer that. It's me and my lifelong pal, Bo Ransdell. I mean, come on. Is it really possible to remake a truly independent, mostly illegal, threat to public safety, definitely litigious 1970s car chase box office blockbuster when you're a modern day movie studio best known for family entertainment? Should Oscar winning actors be cast in a movie that's mostly automotive eye candy and special effects? And what's a better name for a car chase action movie hero? Mandrian Pace or Memphis Reigns? Is that really his name in this movie? Memphis Reigns? I don't even remember that. Well, to answer these questions and many, many more, let's not wait one second longer. Let's get Bo in here and take this movie for a spin. Ladies and gentlemen, fasten your seatbelts. It is the year 2000's Gone in 60 Seconds. And welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I am Chad Cooper. Joined with me, as always, is Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, how are you doing this evening? Uh, I am revving to go. Is that an expression? I don't think it is now that I've said it out loud. <laughs> um, I'm excited. My engine's revved. I don't know, man. Uh, car pun. I'm eager to talk about this movie almost as much as I am to talk about the original movie on which it's based, which is really the superior product. As your introduction very notably pointed out, it is a work of madcap genius, that first movie. It's not really a good movie. It's just irresponsible. Yes! And it's so fun to watch out. Irre- <laughs> it's like watching that movie, uh, what was it? Was it Zoo? What was the name of that? The one that Jan DeBont did in California at some preserve where he just ran around with actors and a bunch of fucking lines. Right. It's that level of irresponsibility of like, like the man died making the sequel. That's how irresponsible he was. But beautifully so. Like he died as he lived by the seat of his fucking pants. Which it's also weird that this is only our second Nicolas Cage movie. And both of these films are remakes of arguably better films that came out in kind of that gritty 1960s, 1970s era of the inmates running the asylum they're just crazy films that are so much better than their contemporary counterparts yeah i don't don't think there's any arguable to it i think yes that like the original wicker man the original gone in 60 seconds are superior films gone in 60 seconds the remake maybe comes closer in that again if you're not paying attention it seems like you're watching a movie It feels like a movie that was made by artificial intelligence screenwriting software. Right. Well, it has all of the appropriate components of what you think an action movie should be, but it is just absent of any soul because you've got this hero, you know, who gets pulled back into a life of crime because his brother is in trouble. And we've got the brash ex-girlfriend and we've got this sage older mentor and we got a black guy who is wisecracking. You know, in fact, we got two black guys that are wisecracking and there's hackers and there's nerds and there's two detectives and you're watching this whole thing because there's stunts and there's a racing it's time and it's all there in theory but in practice you just look in its eyes and it's just dead and has no pulse it's cold to the touch uh black eyes a doll's (laughs) eyes 
<laughs> when you look in those eyes and they roll up white. And that gone in 60 seconds starts revving. It really is a movie that gets by a lot on the fact that the cast is really stacked. Holy shit, is it stacked? I mean, like, these actors could make a crazy good movie <laughs> in under different circumstances. It's not this. No. It's also weird how little Nicolas Cage, Angelina Jolie, and Robert Duvall are even in this movie. Yeah, the secret star of this movie is Delroy Lindo. <laughs> And that ain't no, that's not a bad thing. I will watch the adventures of Detective Delroy Lindo any day of the week and twice on Sunday. It's like that adult swim, the mysteries of Mike Tyson or whatever the hell it's called. You give me that Delroy Lindo animated series. I'll watch that. Yeah. I mean, like the guy's got a face like a catcher's mitt, which is unfortunate, but Jesus Christ is like, he is gravitas in a suit. He is one of those actors that I think got short shrift a little bit because Samuel L. Jackson. Jackson came along. I feel like that was his Achilles heel is that he doesn't have quite the swagger mm -hmm. of a Sam Jackson, but he's he feels like more of the Paul Robeson style actor okay. than Superfly. All right. You know what I mean? Like he feels like a stage actor almost. Yeah, I could see that. He he's good in this, and we'll get to all that. But so, uh, but it's it's produced by Jerry Bruckheimer. We get that old school Touchstone Pictures logo with that long blue tube coming in, forming a circle. That's always nice, yeah, isn't it? Long blue tube, sure it is. <laughs> then, then we get that Jerry Bruckheimer logo with that long road on the horizon and the, li and the lightning. <laughs> that lightning strikes that tree, and you're like, oh man, this means only one thing. There was cocaine on the set of this movie. No shit, man. My no. In fact, is ah uh, Jerry Bruckheimer movies when all the world was made of cocaine. You remember when it used to be Don Simpson slash Jerry Bruckheimer Productions? Don Simpson, Jerry Bruckheimer, and Tony Scott mm -hmm. are responsible for like half of the cocaine consumption in California in the 80s and 90s. Don Simpson, remember he died and his initial death was attributed to, quote, natural causes but then his autopsy and toxicology report said he died of heart failure caused by combined drug intoxication specifically citing cocaine and prescription medications while he was going to the bathroom and i'm assuming he was making a number two and not a number one you gotta think that it, it was the stray that one push <laughs> That that just popped his cork, man. That is, I don't know. Maybe that's the way to go. Maybe like his last moment was like, ah, oh, that got it. <laughs> it was like there will be blood. He just was like, I'm finished. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So poor Don Simpson died as he lived, shitting on cocaine. Yeah. Well, you know what? That's more for the cast and crew of Gone in 60 Seconds. Speaking of which, let's talk about this movie. Before we get to that, one other slight diversion. Is it Tony Scott that Saul Rubinek is supposed to be playing in True Romance? I don't know. I can't, As you ask that question, I also get confused by who Tom Cruise is playing in Tropic Thunder. They all sort of mesh together in these you know slightly bloated coked up movie producer wackadoo types yeah anyway well at any rate if you haven't seen true romance in a while watch the Saul Rubin <laughs> scenes he is hysterical <laughs> in that movie so our opening credits of this film it's this outsourced visual package where the <laughs> hands of a stopwatch double as a road where we see a car zip around the second hand as it tick tick ticks along and I'm thinking during this opening sequence please let the credits ends with all this and Andy Rooney tonight on gone in 60 seconds yeah i like the after effects quality of it though it it's one of those things that you know at the time they thought this looks great and now you look at it it's like this looks like garbage but you know what i like more than an opening credit scene to a movie that has nothing to do with the film itself i like a second extended opening credit sequence that fails to have relevance to the movie as well and this movie <laughs> gives us just that <laughs> After the stopwatch, we get this second opening that is full of terrible photoshopped images of Nicolas Cage from his younger formidable years just posted onto photos of other adults to try to collage together a character and a family history. Yes, this is Facebook quality Photoshop. <laughs> 
<laughs> in this opening sequence, we see a photo of Nicolas Cage and his younger brother and their mom and their dad at a car dealership. And the mom in this photo just looks miserable. And dad looks a little bit happy. I'm guessing that he's, you know, he polished off a little old granddad before this memory was captured on film. He's a car salesman, man. He's sure. like the 50s. Are you kidding me? <laughs> it, you, you breakfast is martinis. Lunch is scotch. And then at dinner, you hit the hard stuff. After we see this first image, the camera just dares the audience to make sense of anything that you see after this. It's like that experiment in Clockwork Orange, where throughout this opening, all of the props and photos, they go by so fast, it is impossible to stitch together any sort of backstory or narrative of any of the characters that you see. Yeah, that's because the environmental exposition was gone in 60 seconds, Chad. <laughs> This Photoshop work is terrible. Everyone's head in these photos are all in the wrong direction. They're the wrong size. The shadows and the lighting are thoroughly inconsistent. It just looks like shit. It really does. It's like that Oswald holding the rifle photo <laughs> from JFK. Where it's like, clearly here, if you look. <laughs> The shadow of his gun doesn't fall. Look at where the sun is. It's head scratching, man. This is in the dawn of Photoshop, I suppose. You know, this is 20 years ago now. <laughs> and so at the time, I'm sure thanks to cocaine and the newness of the technology, they were like, this is fucking good, y'all. Look at look at how convincing this is. It looks like Nicolas Cage and Giovanni Ribisi are in the same goddamn yard. <laughs> and it does not. Not at all. <laughs> I think it was kind of like when De Niro showed that kid on the plane his scotch taped together FBI ID and midnight run. Like, how's this look? And that kid's like, looks fine to, to me. me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no this looks like shit this is not passable so we get to the movie itself finally yeah after these these two like they ran out a clock and just were like oh shit we got more credits uh how about we film a sepia antique store for the rest of the credits right but then they go uh to giovanni rabisi who is playing kip mm -hmm. the younger brother uh in the in the movie Yep. There's Mirror Man, who's his jive talking buddy. Jive talking, that's code for black, right, Bo? Yeah, well, and he's a bit of a wiseacre as well. Uh, wiseacre, that's code for black, right, Bo? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, he's, uh, I don't know. I don't know of a, a synonym for wiseacre now that I think about it. A ne'er do well, perhaps. <laughs> urban? Yeah, he's urban. He's an urban ne'er do well. <laughs> that's what they call him on Fox News. <laughs> right. A band of urban ne'er-do-wells oh. were gunned down by the police tonight, rightly so. Mother, lock the windows. <laughs> Get me my pills. Dial 91 and just wait. If you see anyone in a hoodie, just shoot. Oh, racist white people. What won't you do? <laughs> Who won't you kill? <laughs> um. So let's, let's stop for one second and talk about the fact that one of the characters' names in this movie is Freb. F-R-E-B. Freb. It's Freb. <laughs> I looked it up because I was like, surely not. These subtitles surely aren't telling me that this character's name is Freb. Unexplained, there's no, nobody ever questions it. If somebody introduced you to their child, Freb, you would immediately be like, where is he from, Altair 7? Where did you get the name Freb? Is it a family name? Or did you come from Atlantis? You would at least ask if you heard it right. Like, did you say Freb or Fred? I'm sorry? Fred? You said Fred? No, with a B. Freb. No, Freb. Are you trying to get this kid killed? Do you hate your child? His name is Freb Terrorist Bin Laden. Or I'd be like, who trims your, your man bun? That's a lovely, lovely do you have there, sir. My real name is William, but everyone calls me Freb. <laughs> the fuck? And so... <laughs> Kip, Mirror Man, and Freb are eyeballing this silver Porsche in a showroom. Mm -hmm. At night. In Los Angeles. And uh, Kip says, like, hey, we got to get in there. He he gets out of the car and he goes, hey, hold on a minute. Because Kip is all sweaty and his hair is greasy. And he's got this, like, eight-day-old beard. Yeah. And he's, I'm sure he's wearing plaid, but I may be remembering that wrong. But let's just say, is he just, he looks like a drug addict because that's what he is. He's, he's a father's worst nightmare, people. Okay, you bring Kip home. And I got to tell you, mom is crying herself to sleep that night. Okay. 
So Kip gets out of the car and he was like, I, I got to go get my tool. And he goes to the trunk of the car and he opens up and there are a bunch of tools there, but there's a big brick in the middle. And I know it's a brick because Mirror Man, the wiseacre, he says, Kip, that's not a tool. That's a damn brick. You know, lest anyone in the audience be confused by Kip's words and actions. And so Kip just takes this brick and just chunks it through the front pane glass window of this car dealership, setting off alarms and causing all types of mayhem to be in instigated yes and so while he is he, he gets what mirror man to get the key he calls out the number of the the car in the dealership to mirror man who's at the box with all the keys he gets the corresponding keys throws it to kip they get into this porsche and there's a moment where mirror man is like oh no you're you're not gonna go through the front window are you kip and kip just oils a little bit in response <laughs> <laughs> just oozes a little by way of agreement and then takes off out the front window of the dealership the whole time in this scene mirror man is kind of the narrator of what is happening in the movie for anyone that i don't know is in the theater that might be visually impaired it's a lot like listening to our podcast except you have visuals in the movie and it is arguably less entertaining than listening to us talk yes it is 100 percent less entertaining everything that we are going to say we could stop talking and just have silence for the next 90 minutes or so and it would be more entertaining <laughs> than listening to what these actors have to say in this movie speaking of well our, our movie's getting exciting Bo. so let's cut away to a garage where we meet a band of car thieves just hanging out there's like two or five or seven of them i have no idea and the first guy we meet is tumblr and my first thought is hey this guy's the safe cracker but he's not a safe cracker and i was like well maybe he's an acrobat or maybe he worked at a laundromat maybe he was the lead singer in a culture club cover band called i'll tumble for yous and he was the head tumbler i don't know why he's called tumble yeah it's not explained he's it's scott con with a, a shitty handlebar mustache i don't even know what a scott con is it's james con's kid Oh my god. Yeah, that's right. Did he do anything after this? Yeah, he was in those Ocean's 11 movies. Oh, that was him? Yeah. He was Brad Pitt. He's been in some stuff. He he I mean not anything like his father, but he he's been in some stuff. His dad was uh, an elf. And he also kicked a guy's ass down the street in The Godfather in one of the greatest <laughs> scenes ever committed to film. <laughs> Hitting him with that garbage can lid. Now that's a fucking fight. He also fu he fucked a bridesmaid against a wall in that movie. Oh, that was pretty awesome. Sonny Corleone is one of the great characters in movie history. He is such a hot-headed dickhead. He's doomed from the, the moment you see him. You know he's going to get himself killed. He's one of the few guys, aside from Rocky Balboa, that can really pull off a wife beater. Yes, and it, because of the tufts of hair surrounding <laughs> it so that the, the straps of the wife beater almost disappear in the thicket <laughs> of his shoulder hair. But speaking of Sagat Khan... Yeah, Tumblr. He is introducing the real class of this movie by detailing The Stranger, in which he describes sitting on his hand until it goes numb and then jerking off. And then it's like, you know, a stranger is doing it. It's what every kid has ever heard in middle school. All right, hey, hey, we, we, we got to unpack this. He says, yo, check out my new move. I call it The Stranger. <laughs> Right, like he he's taking credit for it. It's a very Trump move. Like, yes, the stranger, I that was me. <laughs> he has a repertoire of, as he calls them, moves when it comes to, again, using his own words, rubbing one out. I want to know what other moves he has at his disposal. Because when I think of the variety of how men jerk off, you kind of have like traditional. Uh -huh. And then you have, you know, when you're kind of down on your luck, you have the public library. Yeah. And I like, I just went out and asked a handful of people if they had any other signature moves, which most of them walked away. And only two people offered up suggestions. One of them was the little Jack Horner, kind of self explanatory. Sure. And then another one was the Jackson Brown. It involves the song <laughs> Rosie, where you use a wedding ring and you do it at night in the dark. I thought it was more of a flogging the dolphin reference about him beating up Daryl Hannah. <laughs> or she was in Splash. That's right. That's that's why I thought of it. Um, Rosie, you're all right. You wear my ring when you hold me tight. 
<laughs> that whole song is about masturbating. My move is the up and down real fast. Followed by shame and regret. Yeah, right. Followed by lonely tears. <laughs> and a lot of introspection. A lot of self inventory. But you and I have a mutual acquaintance who told me once that he would masturbate while gently rubbing his balls with a wire hairbrush. And once I heard that from him, I had so many more questions. First, I was like, <laughs> whose wire brush are you using? And two, did the owner of the brush ever find out? And if they didn't find out what was going on, did that heighten the experience? Oh, yeah. Do you want to guess who it was? I mean, it's got to be. <laughs> it's 100%. Yeah. If the question is, hey, what person do we know in common that has this weird sexual picadillo? <laughs> I love him so much. Yes. He's a sweetheart of a guy, but he just likes rubbing his balls on balloons and shit. <laughs> solid gold oh my god all right so back to our movie yeah oh right <laughs> so finally a real actor pipes up in the scene which is will Patton, <laughs> who is the maybe best known by me at least as the villain from the postman <laughs> and also the narrator of my favorite audiobooks he is a phenomenal audiobook narrator he's the elder statesman of our crew of merry band of masturbating car thieves so atley is like hey where's kip and mirror man and who the fuck is the other guy freb is it freb farb farb all right where are they <laughs> They're like oh yeah we were having a car scene earlier where people were stealing a expensive automobile let's cut back to that so we see kip and mirror man and ferb and they're driving the uh around and kip and mirror man are in the porsche and the car pulls up to this red light and there's this random couple in another what appears to be an expensive car at the light next to them and it's real late at night there's no other cars in the road so kip just starts fucking with this other couple and he starts calling out hey hey sweetie you're so talented i love you and then the light turns green and for some reason these two cars just start racing down the streets of you said it was los angeles i guess and then here mirror man our narrator just starts screaming out man this is a stolen car the police are gonna get us we're gonna go to jail i'm gonna shit he's gonna kill us first he's gonna shit then he's gonna kill us as these two cars zoom around there's another cop arresting a guy for whatever infraction and the cop's like 20 out of 12 there's a, a expensive porsche zipping around you need to go chase these guys and you're like oh yeah this is getting good but you know what let's cut back to tumblr the guy who likes to jerk off with a lifeless hand it's not what you think and we see him turning a black light off and on against this wall that displays the names of all the cars that they're trying to steal and i gotta tell you about i was very concerned that tumblr was gonna shine this black light up on the wall and it was gonna look like a jackson pollock painting of 101 dalmatians right like tonight on criminal minds <laughs> or maybe more appropriately law and order special victims unit i don't think a guy who is so free with the Discussing his personal extracurricular jactivities should ever wield a black light in such a cavalier fashion. I disagree, Chad. Uh, who's got the experience? You know? <laughs> he's cleaning up a crime scene every night aside from his semen splatter <laughs> posting the cars that they're stealing on the wall in this fashion is the most ill-conceived means of inventory management i've ever seen in my life it's it's one of those things that happens in a movie but it would never happen in real life no it, it's the equivalent of writing it in lemon juice so that when you apply heat to it you know oh look there are all the license plates of the cars it's real dumb but it's it's one of a million things in this movie that's like, this is not how you would do this. We're going to write our secrets on the walls in this magic ink that can only be seen when we turn on this light. Right. It is in no way portable and we can't quickly destroy it. No! How about this? Why don't you use a computer or a piece of paper? Right. Like if the cops show up, you're 100% busted. Yeah. I mean, this is the year 2000. This is not, you know, 1975. You can get an IBM ThinkPad as, as one. One very wise man noted, one stringer bell on the wire, you do not take notes during a motherfucking criminal conspiracy. 
No. Like, you, all of this stuff is completely destroyed the second everyone knows what they're doing. So the cops, of course, show up because they've been chasing Kip and Mirror Man and Farb. And when all the fuzz shows up, this team of thieves, they run around and they turn off the black lights and they're running around their hideout. And this one guy runs over to the wall and he tries to wash off all the names of the cars they're going to steal by spraying Miller High Life from an open bottle on them. Mm-hmm. That doesn't work, Bo. That, that's not how paint works. Beer can make memories fade, but not phosphorescent paint. Yeah, it it can make memories fade and it can fast forward the present. (laughs) It's not not, not a good cleaning solution. The whole crew splits up, leaving all the cars behind that they've stolen. And on their way out, our elder statesman, he breaks the blacklight bulb so that the cops later will have a way to find their Cracker Jack wall-based invisible semen stain finding inventory management system. And then... Enter the true stars of the movie. Yes. Delroy Lindo. Detective Delroy Lindo. Detective Delroy Lindo and Detective Timothy Oliphant. Again, I know you haven't seen Justified, but you should. It's a good show. I know! I've heard this from so many people. And Sam Elliott shows up in that last season and it is all right. They find the cars that were boosted, which is the lingo they use in the movie. They boost cars. Delroy Lindo is walking around just kind of giving a lecture about, well, these guys are professionals. They did this and this. He says, I want all these cars in here and pounded for a month. And as he's given this order, he steps on the fragments of the broken black light. Uh-huh. And he's like, huh, this looks like a clue. <laughs> And then we we leave our detectives to go to Monday at 2.15 p.m. Because now it's Dragnet. Right. And Nicolas Cage is giving a big speech about how... you're going to race fast and like he's it, it's a pep talk for race car drivers and it is the most telegraphed joke in the world because as he is giving this pep talk the camera then looks down to see that these are all children yeah what he is essentially doing is running a go-kart track aka babysitting service for hillbillies mm-hmm where parents drop off their kids, he yells at them for a little while, and then they run around on a go-kart track. And the use of sepia tones and these oversaturated primary colors in this scene makes all of this look like a remake of The Little Rascals. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, or Mad Max Fury Road. You know, take your pick. It's either a hellish apocalypse or... Or it's Mad Max Fury Road. Yeah. (laughs) Mad Max Fury Road is kind of are present in a number of ways really this group of kids drive around this track in their go-karts and nicholas cage is just screaming and encouraging them to shave seconds off their time he's just like come on you can do it come on brian come on Brittany, you can totally make this happen and i will say that upon initial viewing of this scene the movie does an adequate job of endearing you the viewer to our hero of the film nicholas cage as he's being kind and encouraging to small children hey keep off the wall god damn it <laughs> i'll kill you and your parents about this time atley shows up and nicholas cage says i folded atley you know that i said i'd never get pulled into this life no matter the circumstances never ever will i return to the life that i left behind i found a new life here at the go-kart track with these hillbilly children atley lays it on me. he's like well you know your brother kip now he he fumbled the job he is pretty jammed up Oh my God, Atley, my brother's in trouble. Hold on a minute. Old man in the back working on a motor. Come out here and watch these children. And this old man comes out from the go-kart, you know, garage. And he's just like, which one of you wants to sit on my lap while I drive around the track? (laughs) Who wants to try the champagne of beers? (laughs) It's fun to drive when you're a little buzzed. I've got a surprise in my pocket. (laughs) And so while uh, Nicolas Cage abandons these children to this pervert from the back of the garage, Atlee is telling him all about this new, uh, there's a new player in town named Kalitri. And <laughs> I swear to God, a computer wrote this movie. Uh, so Kalitri, who, by the way, is a British guy. I don't know why his name is Kalitri. Yeah. And he's also into carpentry. Yeah. He's the carpenter. We'll, uh, we'll get to all this. Here in a second. It's, <laughs> this is real fucking dumb. Nicholas Cage is like, hey, how do you know all this stuff? And uh, and Atlee's like, well, I work for him now, too. And uh, he's like, I got to tell you, this guy, he even scares me. 
Memphis. And so let's talk about this for a second. The name Nicolas Cage has in this movie is fucking Memphis Reigns. <laughs> Not All right, let's for one second, I want to point out he had a run in the mid 90s of this shit. <laughs> like The Rock, he is Stanley Goodspeed. In Con Air, <laughs> he is Cameron Poe. <laughs> Face Off is a real high water mark. He's Caster Troy in that one. But Chad, I want to give you a brief quiz. Yes! What other famous heroes from cinema and television include a geographical place? I'm going to give you the name of this hero. What I would like you to do, Chad, is to name the actor or actress portraying this role. Fuck. For example, I say Indiana Jones, you say... Harrison Ford. That's right. Let's start with the easy ones. I've had so much to drink and I'm so nervous. Let's let me just shake it out. Here we go. All right, go. Hannah Montana. Miley Cyrus. That's right. Johnny Utah. Pass. <laughs> and Scano Reeves. Minnesota Fats. Jackie Gleason. That's right. Nevada Smith. I don't know. Steve McQueen. Okay. Nathan Arizona. Nicholas Cage. No, that's Trey Wilson. Wait, what? Nathan Arizona is the father of Nathan Jr. Fuck. Originally, Nathan Huffines, but no one was going to buy furniture from a place called Unpainted Huffines. It was a trick question. Most certainly not. Uh, then, finally, Florida Evans. Hold on. I know this one. I know you know it. Uh, it is... Oh, oh, let, oh what, what the... Hold on. Her name was... Almost out of time. Esther Roll. That is right. Yes! Damn, 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 I'm good! You are... You have won. Uh, so well done, sir. <laughs> so after Atlee says uh, he used to work for the carpenter, he's like, hey, man, he's a bad dude. Our movie cuts over to Kip, the younger brother slash drug addict, and they're handcuffing him to a car. And by them, I mean the bad guys. And the car's getting scooped up by a forklift, and it's going to be placed into the car crusher at a junkyard. So here we get this wide shot, and it's pretty clear that we are at the finale of of a Shane Black film, Sands the Christmas Lights. It's night. We've got shipping containers. There's lots of big trucks moving around a metal uh, shipyard. There's a guitar solo. I think in the distance, there's a saxophone playing to really set the mood for this scene. I hate to say it. I hate to say it. It's probably me. Sorry. I went so, Lethal Weapon 3 immediately. We cut to inside. And here we see our villain, the carpenter, in his lair. And it kind of looks at, like that part of Santa's workshop where there's a bunch of half-finished woodworking type carvings that are partially through production, like a hobby horse or a dollhouse or something that no kid would really ever want. Uh, Nicolas Cage comes in and he meets the film's villain, the carpenter. And as you noted earlier, he's got a British accent, which qualifies him to be a sinister bad guy in a 90s era movie or maybe the definitive opinion on an american television game show featuring singing dancing or possibly baking yes he is uh, was later doctor who in the reboot of that show for uh, nerds like myself was he a good doctor who uh he only did it for one season he was fine that sounds like a no yeah the carpenter knows about <laughs> Nicolas Cage's history as a car thief. And then the carpenter just starts spouting off about all of his like wooden tables and chairs he's been building. You don't really give a shit about any of that. In this movie, his carpentry fixation is tantamount to one of those things where they give a bad guy like a quirky hobby, you know, like having a fish tank filled with exotic, you know, sea life, or maybe they play chess right? or they feel spin around and retract the blade of a butterfly knife. Yeah. Movie bot knife. 9,000 assigns quirk carpentry this movie is awful so one thing that i like in this scene is that you know he's being real baroque about like oh, oh look here's my furniture and you know however british people talk and he is saying like i hate baseball it's so boring which is true but still you don't want a british person saying that in your face if you're an american and then he's like i hate this country i hate being here it sucks and it, you're like this is a professional wrestling villain he is just the iron sheik at this point or whatever the british equivalent of that is your representative democracy it's laughable i hate the way you prance around with your freedoms <laughs> this dude looks like the host of a pbs 2p 
p.m. on the Sunday afternoon show called Langshire Living Woodcrafting from Across the Pond. Right. There's nothing threatening about this movie's villain whatsoever. And at that point, Nicolas Cage is like, where's my brother? And then the carpenter says, you got to steal 50 cars by 8 a.m. four days from now. And I'm going to give you $200,000. And Nicolas Cage says, I'm not interested. I left this life behind me. I said I would never get pulled back into the world of high stakes car thievery. And then the carpenter says, I gave your brother $10,000 and I hired him and I'm not going to take your money to pay off his debt. I need 50 cars or my South American friend goes somewhere else. I need these cars. If I don't deliver these cars, then I look like an arsehole. And do I look like an arsehole, Nicolas Cage? And Nicolas Cage says, yeah, you look like an asshole. You know, letting the guy know they're not going to be friends. Right. And he's like, where's my brother? And then the carpenter shows Nicolas Cage this casket that he's crafted, implying that he's going to put his brother in that. And then Nicolas Cage... And then the carpenter takes Nicolas Cage outside where we see Kip still handcuffed to the steering wheel of this automobile and he's still inside the car crush. Ah! And everybody at this point just pulls guns on everybody. There's like 12 guns that appear out of nowhere and everyone is in threat of being shot by someone else. So at this point, Kalitri, our carpenter villain, is like, I'm going to give you three choices. You can either watch your brother die right now. All right, that's choice one. All right. And then choice number two, you can do what I say, yes. fail, mm. and I kill your brother anyway. I don't like that choice. I didn't think you would. Or three, you get me 50 cars, and I give you $200,000, and we walk away, friends. That's only $4,000 a car. That does not seem financially sound. Right, but finally, he's like, no, go on, really, you should. Or I'm going to kill your brother right in front of you. And, and finally, Cage is like, well, all right, I guess. It's such an unsuspenseful moment. Because the instructions that the carpenter gives him, it goes on forever. While in the background, Kip is getting crushed by this machinery. And so they turn off the crusher and Kip gets out. And act one has arguably ended. Then we go to stupid act two. Well, before we do that, though, let's just for one second talk about how not only is Christopher Eccleston as Kalitri not very thrilled threatening he looks like he's going to give you an estimate on a classic cookie tin as uh-huh. opposed to murder your brother there's also no real backstory like why the fuck did this guy get sent from wales or whatever to los angeles to open a scrap yard wood shop <laughs> right to be the go-between between some south american guy who wants 50 cars instead of this other guy johnny b that we'll meet in a minute and it's just like i don't understand any of this world if you're gonna show me criminal empires Mm -hmm. you gotta john wick it a little bit give me a little bit of backstory give me a little bit of lore the backstory is he doesn't want to look like an asshole the thing is with the go-to villain comparison here like a hans gruber he'll come up later sure but (laughs) yeah it will (laughs) but he was always kind of one step ahead and he was really clever and you also knew what he wanted and he was in the movie, Bo. Sure. This guy is in the movie now, and he shows up at the end of Act 3. He's not in the movie at all. Right. That's why we have to talk about it now, because he disappears from the movie after this as we go into Act 2, where there's an entire new cast of characters that we're going to ignore. And <laughs> so we cut to Kip making breakfast in his shithole apartment yeah. for Nicolas Cage. And it's like a kid making, like, gummy bear soup or something. Nicholas cage asks him what did you put in this and kip laughs uncomfortably and says i don't know kip's a drug addict Uh, there's just a box with a crossbones on it and i just put some of that in there and some eggs and some jelly cat food (laughs) um, a condom used a part of a reese's cup wrapper for flavor band-aids dandruff lipstick fingernails one thumbtack you you get it if you get it you're lucky for the day nicholas cage takes a bite of this food and all but vomits yeah rightfully so he's just like oh this is horrible Dude, this house looks like the Sawyer home from OG Chainsaw Massacre. It looks like the kind of place you sneak out of (laughs) when you wake up in the morning not knowing how the hell you got there. 
Nicolas Cage asks his brother Kip, does mom know anything about all of this? And then Kip says, no, she doesn't. I got all this under control. And I'm like, is your mom buried in the crawl space beneath the spare bedroom? To punctuate his moment of confidence, behind him, a pan is on fire from his concoction that he Mm -hmm. tried to murder his brother with. I like how he tries to put it out with a grease-stained rag. I was just happy he didn't grab a can of aerosol hairspray or toss a gross of black cats on top of it. You're like, I got this! And there's some real good show-don't-tell writing here where Nicolas Cage just picks up like a bag of flour and and puts the fire out and once again saves his brother who is an interminable fuck up back at the dock detective delroy lindo and detective timothy oliphant they show up and they shake down this informant about the delivery date for a bunch of cars and we cut away from that to nicholas cage arriving at a diner and he walks inside and he says i'm looking for helen rains my name is memphis rains we have the same last name and this waitress is like helen somebody's looking for you and then helen says what guy what's he look like and because this movie is assumes that the audience is full with dummies nicholas cage says he looks like me your son me memphis reigns and you're my mom you are the one who gave me the nickname memphis don't you remember mom <laughs> nicholas cage has flowers in his hands for his mother and she said looks at me she's like what do you want and then there's a cop in the diner who sees nicholas cage and he calls up delroy lindo and he's like hey man nicholas cage is here in this diner with all those women that have cigarette smoke raspy voices and then moms and nicholas cage they sit down and they start chatting at this booth and then nicholas cage spills the beans on kit being a screw up and Nicolas Cage says I can help Kip but it means me doing things things I said I would never do again and the moms is like do it Nicolas Cage you gotta go save Kip he's a fuck up are you sure it could mean long division you know how I swore I would never see a remainder again look Kip's my dealer go save him the mother by the way for nerds like myself will recognize uh grace zabriskie as the mom here who was laura palmer's mother on twin peaks i didn't recognize her at all well of course not because you haven't seen twin peaks you <laughs> uncultured philistine <laughs> Nicholas Cage leaves the diner and outside he runs into Delroy Lindo, Detective Delroy Lindo, <laughs> and as well as Detective Timothy Oliphant. And here, Delroy Lindo asks Nicholas Cage, hey, is it odd that you're in town at the same time we found a warehouse filled with cars, the kind of cars like you used to steal, you know, six years ago when you walked away from the life of stealing cars and you swore that you would never do this again and I, Detective Delroy Lindo, had the chance to put you away forever, but I didn't do it. And is there any more exposition that I need to get out of this scene? No. All right, well, then we'll kind of end it. And Timothy Oliphant as the good time detective in in this scene. By good time, you mean high? Yeah. He's like, hey, man, (laughs) we're going to put you away so long by the time you get out, there's only going to be spaceships, man. (laughs) And Nicolas Cage is just like, what is he stone detective <laughs> and then we get the first mention delroy lindo is like hey you gonna be on the lookout for eleanor nicholas cage is like that's a low blow so it's our first mention of eleanor which we will get the explanation for that a little bit later oh, kind of who and what an eleanor is my grandmother's first name was eleanor maybe he's looking for my grandma i, I like that the coda on this scene is like uh, timothy oliphant had made some comment about like oh yeah like your wife man uh to detective delroy Roy Lindo. And so the scene ends with Lindo being like, hey, don't you ever talk about my wife again. <laughs> like, I like him drawing that line in the sand, like, look, it's all fun and games, but you keep your fucking mouth shut about that woman. I think my sister's first name is Eleanor. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, I I really think it is. Did she change it again? Did she change it? <laughs> There's a good chance. <laughs> She's a handful. Sure she is. So Johnny <laughs> Cash is singing Folsom Prison Blues, Chad, as we come to the garage, uh, which is going to be a, a large portion of our movie, mm-hmm. where Robert Duvall is kind of flirting with uh, Francis Fisher, a.k.a. his wife, Junie. Francis Fisher is too big of an actress to be playing such a shit role. I mean, I know Duvall is too big to be playing his shit role but for her i was like you know you deserve better yes because all she does in this movie is give somebody the stink eye and walk off and is in the background at the end of this movie saying nothing yeah she is completely wasted in this so nicholas cage finds robert duvall and he's like 
hey, you know how we used to work together and you had a chop chop? What are you doing now? And he, Robert Duvall tells him that he he doesn't destroy anything anymore. Now he creates. He restores cars. And uh, Robert Duvall is like, hey, hey, let me play this, uh, a tape for you like he used to in the old days there, Nicolas Cage. Uh, see if you can recognize it. And he plays this sound of just a car engine revving. Uh-huh. And it's like, oh yeah, that's 1961 Le Mans. And just like all this crazy detail about this engine and he's like it's a v12 and robert duvall being robert duvall is just like that that you got it just right nicholas cage that's a v12 it is so good to see you then nicholas cage is like hey you remember i had a brother named kip anyway he's in trouble with a guy named kalitri and robert duvall's uh is like yeah i i, I heard a name he is a, a jackal feeding on the soft underbelly of this city isn't it amazing how robert duvall in anything is just perfection yes like remember when he was in that scarlet letter movie that was just an abortion of a train wreck of a film but his performance you're just like man he's good yeah he makes everything better like we in our in, on next week's film or ne- next episode's film is going to be another prime example of this of elevating the material is he in next week's film yes he is sir oh yeah he is in next week's film. yes Yes, he is. I thought he was in the film after that, but Burt Reynolds is in that. That's right. All right. I, I can't believe I got Burt Reynolds and Robert Duvall mixed up. Shame on me. Yeah. <laughs> They're both awesome. Uh, Robert Duvall, funny name. <laughs> <laughs> so but robert duvall is like look you know i i asked you not to come back here nicholas cage gives him the lowdown he's like i've got to steal 50 cars in three days and if we don't do it kip is dead so cage is like look you got a good thing going here with that redhead i think that's clint eastwood's wife <laughs> 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 You're walking on dangerous ground, Robert Duvall. He talks to stools. It's not what you're thinking. Batman single-handedly took Grenada. I saw the movie. And (laughs) (laughs) as he's about to leave, Robert Duvall's like, wait, before you go, just, you know, these days, I'm all about second chances there. Memphis reigns and uh, he's like all right let's commit some crimes so then we start to assemble the team right. that supposedly like the one of the best parts of any movie where you're getting the gang back together oceans 11 this movie is not no <laughs> <laughs> so our first candidate is Chi McBride, who plays uh, what is, Donnie. Donnie in this movie. And he's teaching a driving lesson. The driver is, surprise, surprise, a very bad Asian woman driver. And Donnie's a black guy. That's kind of important, too. Yes. He says to her, like, look, maybe you should just give up. I can't swim, so I keep my black ass out of the pool, which is the best joke in the whole movie. Bo, you know a white guy wrote this film, right? I do know that. <laughs> it's painfully obvious um and he shows up in this movie god bless him (laughs) so she uh starts crying she sounds like a balloon squeaking out air when she cries it's like yeah right (laughs) just stop donnie gets a call on his cell phone and he's like who is this memphis reigns oh i'm in and just gets out of the car like the beginning of fucking stripes and just abandons the car and this woman completely in the middle of the road but what you would expect in a better movie is that we would then proceed to go through other people getting a call and being like oh memphis reigns needs me i'm on my way no because this this movie needs to be two hours long for some ungodly reason but then everyone that they call tells them to fuck off you get donnie and then it's swing and a miss swing and a miss swing and a miss no one else says yes yeah until they get to like the last two names on their list Mm -hmm. which are sway and sphinx right and sphinx uh it doesn't talk it's vinnie jones not saying anything in this movie they they call him up and he's working at a morgue and these two i don't like interns or something are arguing about how a guy who can't talk is going to answer a phone call and then sphinx picks it up And you hear Nicolas Cage say, hey, Sphinx, press one if it's you. And then Sphinx goes, and I was like, well, how does Nicolas Cage know that this is actually Sphinx? It could be anybody. Yeah. Sphinx, if it's you, do absolutely nothing. You've made me the happiest man in the world. Press nine for Espanol. (laughs) According to some reports that I read, Sphinx was supposed to be a character that had his nose missing, but they changed it up because it was kind of a pain in the ass to do the makeup of a missing nose guy. Mm. 
And my question was, well, why not just change the name of the character? Call him Keaton or Teller or Silent Bob, considering how they rip off that character's signature bit in the last two minutes of this film. Yeah, this movie doesn't have an original bone in its body. I mean, it's a remake, I know, but... It not only does it rip off the original material, it's just a catch as catch can of 2000s movies. Script bot 2000, Clerks is funny, will use material from that film for reboot of Gone in 60 Seconds. Comedy is unexpected. What is more unexpected than quiet guy talking at end of movie? <laughs> har har, har har, har har. Script bot 2000, you've done it again. <laughs> Another jewel in the cap for ScriptBot 2000. ScriptBot 2000, I need you to crank out something called the Santa Claus 2. Santa Claus needs a wife. ScriptBot 2000 is on the case. We subtitle it the Mrs. Claus. Har, har. ScriptBot 2000, can you do any wrong? We don't even have to pay this guy. You just plug him in and he cranks out the hits. Am I right? <laughs> Touchstone. ScriptBot 2000 would like some of that cocaine. <laughs> it can work more efficiently with cocaine. <laughs> I don't know, ScriptBot 2000. This stuff don't come cheap. ScriptBot is pretty sure it can increase output 4,000%. 4,000%. That sounds like a lot. Boys, get ScriptBot 2000 as much cocaine as he wants. Mm, that is the good stuff. That's pure. All right. I'm ready to do Santa Claus 3 now. Has anyone here heard of Jack Frost? <laughs> it writes itself. Har har. I mean, ScriptBot 2000 writes it. I need more cocaine. <laughs> this is getting expensive, ScriptBot. <laughs> <laughs> so Nicolas Cage goes to find Sway, who is Angelina Jolie in this movie. She, oh, hold on, is she in this film? Yeah, you, it's a real blink and you miss it. This is again, you know, script by two thousand. We need a love interest. Her name is Sway. She will be in four scenes. Yeah, it is unbelievable. Speaking of wasting your female talent in this movie, Academy Award winning, as you pointed out, Angelina Jolie, mm -hmm. who has nothing to do with nothing in this movie. No. You could pull her wholesale out of it, and it changes nothing about this movie. There's a lot of characters in this film you could pull out. Yes. You can get rid of, like, Master P. Is that his name? Mirror Man, Toby... Just, Burb. Hell, half the cast. You can get rid of all of yeah. them. And the movie does still keeps on rocking and rolling. But her character, she's got like these like crazy pool blue eyes that you could just swim in. Like Paul Newman's got nothing on her. And she's got these blonde dreadlocks hanging all down. She looks like the lead singer of Four Non Blondes, which is kind of an oxymoron. <laughs> I guess maybe because of her hair color. But at this in this scene, Angelina Jolie, she pops up and she asks Nicolas Cage, hey, what time is it? Angelina Jolie points out, hey, I'm late for my other job as a bartender. But as Angelina Jolie leaves the garage where she works her day job, her character takes a good hard swig out of this tiny can of gasoline. Yeah, I assume that that is not gasoline, that that's hooch or something. But maybe it's gasoline. I don't know. I assumed it was gasoline. And I was like, look, man i've known a lot of drunks in my day but you're the best i've ever seen you, you are a very good drunk <laughs> Nic nicholas cage follows angelina jolie to her job at the bar and angelina jolie when this movie was made it was kind of in the heyday of her billy bob thornton situation and there's more than a hint of crazy behind those baby blues in this film and nicholas cage asks her to join him on the job and she's like no nah, i'm not going to do that i'm not in the life anymore so off we go nicholas cage leaves the bar and uh, real quick we haven't talked about this but nicholas cage in this movie is also blonde haired yes and it's it's a wig right is it i mean i feel like it, this could still be his real hair it's the kind of hair that you try not to stare at but inevitably your eyes are drawn to it it's like hair cleavage you don't want to look and you try not to look but you can't help but looking yeah it's almost like it's frosted but they went too far with it <laughs> so he follows her to her second bartending job well he goes out he goes outside and it's here that he meets rapper master p and he's playing a character named johnny b yeah you think johnny b's last name was good oh if only hey chuck yeah, it's Marvin, your cousin. <laughs> Marvin Barry? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's the kind of exposition that you'll find in a movie like Gone in 60 Seconds. Marvin <laughs> Barry. Everyone got it? I like the emphasis on Barry. Uh-huh. <laughs> We have the same last name. While they're outside, Master P or Johnny B or whatever the hell this guy's name is. He shows up and he sees Nicolas Cage leaving the bar and he says, Hey, Nicolas Cage, you screwed up a lot of my business for me in the past. And then Master P says, You need to get out of Long Beach. He says, Word is, you got an order that should have went to me. And then this outdoor bar brawl just breaks out in the parking lot. And Nicolas Cage is getting his ass kicked. And here sphinx shows up from the shadows and just starts beating the shit out of all of the hooligans and before masterpiece can kind of you know get on his feet sphinx has set a uh, masterpiece car on fire and, and just blows it up which causes the cars next to it to blow up which causes the cars next to them to blow up it's a real grand theft auto moment yeah everything explodes Nicolas Cage is rescued by the Sphinx and they uh they just leave Bo yeah there's no need to speak to the authorities about all of these exploding cars just let's fuck off all right yeah as George Carlin said like you don't want to be there you don't want to be there for that they've got a lot of questions you're not going to want to (laughs) answer so they go to Kip's flop house <laughs> where Nicolas Cage sees a picture of their dad and them as kids. And he's like, boy, things would have been normal if he hadn't died. You remember that Kip? And Kip's like, nah, that's bullshit. Like, you, you know, you never wanted to be normal and you always wanted easy money. And Cage is like, hey, I didn't do it for the money, Kip. I did it for the nookie. The nookie. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he says i did it for the cars this is the point where i'm thinking this movie is two goddamn hours long and we're just dicking around with these two hillbillies jibber jawing at each other they're on a clock man they gotta deliver 50 cars right in four days and they're just dicking around where's the goddamn action in this action movie there is none bo there's none yeah. there is nothing that happens in this movie at all until the very end of act three which is such a disappointment yes the last 30 minutes has action in the action uh in the action film and it's not very good eh, there are a couple of things that are pretty good we'll get to it but so cage finally tells him like kip you're gonna want a normal life someday or you're gonna end up in dead or jail <laughs> and and then it's just like ah eh, fine fuck what as long as we get out of this scene uh intact and then we cut back to the real heroes detective timothy oliphant and detective here we go delroy lindo and oliphant says hey we tracked an employee down at one of the dealerships who's got a jacket and for you and me chad that means he's got a criminal record oh and that he's been ordering keys from germany which is this like fancy laser cut kind that you have to special order from the manufacturers which seems to be chad a clue yes so let's cut away from that sure to nicholas cage and uh, chi mcbride who are going over this list of cars which includes an eleanor which it turns out is a code name for a 67 mustang sure once that exposition is out of the way kip and freb Ugh. and mirror man and toby and tumblr and all these fucking miscreants show up mm-hmm. and kip is bitching about like losing all this money and the brothers are shouting at each other like nicholas cage and kip are yelling at each other about the kip getting himself in this position in the first place and all that shit and duval pulls him aside and is like hey for practical reasons we kind of need your brother and his dumbass friends help right because you may not have heard from the plot of the movie, but we've got to steal 50 cars and we've got less than three days to do it now. Nicholas Cage says, do you guys have any skills? And Kip says, oh yeah, man. Mirror man has some gadgets and Tumblr over there. He jacks off with a dead hand. It's not what you think. <laughs> uh, Toby, I think he's a computer genius. And the audience is just like, Who's Toby? What is a Toby? Have we even met this character? Right. And then Toby spouts off all the things he can do. Like, hey, man, I can hack into the DMV. Which you're like, no, you can't. You can't do that. This explains everyone but Freb. Freb can't do anything. Freb can't do shit. And, and what's even worse, if Freb is going to be the fuck up of the group, he never fucks up. Not really. Yeah. I mean, Toby is kind of presented as the fuck up because they're constantly telling Toby that he can't go with them. Like, oh, no, no, you can't go with us, Toby. Anyway, but so... Let's cut over to Detective Timothy Oliphant, Detective uh, Delroy Lindo, who show up 
to uh what's his name are you gross is the actor's name i think from such films as house two uh-huh and they're squeezing him for some information because he's the dude what works at the mercedes dealership he was ellen's uh male friend on the hit abc sitcom ellen oh he's uh multi-talented mm-hmm so as they're putting the squeeze on him he's like look uh so some guy came and asked me to order these keys i don't know what his name was we kept it all kind of on the down low i don't know what his name but he looked like he uh, a boxer is what he says he resembled a boxer cut to uh the garage and we see dumbass tumbler looking like a boxer and then duvall is kind of giving them a lecture about how like hey we got to do the all of All of these car thefts need to be done in a single night because if they spread it out over a couple of days, the cops are going to get wise to it. They're going to, you know, be on the lookout. If they do it all at once, essentially, by the time the cops realize that the first set of cars is stolen, they're going to have most of the cars in hand. Bo, you're almost an hour into this movie, and there has not been one single car chase. Yeah, I mean, the closest you came is, you know, a little bit of business at the beginning with Kip, but that's not really a car chase. Not really. We cut to Nicolas Cage, and he is now at a car dealership, where his character is acting like a smarmy asshole to get the inside scoop on where Nicolas Cage can find all of these new cars in a warehouse. And Bo, this is where the movie should really start to come together but it's this point in the film where it all falls apart because every character in this film begins to act and behave in ways that are completely different than everything we've seen every character in this film exhibit up until this point in the movie yeah this performance with this car salesman it's just it's just performance art hi there My name is Smarmy McJackass, and I'm super wealthy. I'm looking for an elegant automobile that will help me to get pussy and get laid. Can you help me, my good man? And you're just like, what? What about this character has even remotely implied that he is capable of going in and behaving this way with such a level of deception? It's just incomprehensible. And kind of like merry mischief as opposed to I am trying to save my brother's life. The thing is, it's not truly bonkers, Nicolas Cage. Like it's not super over the top in a way that's entertaining because of just how out there he'll go right it's just him being like you said it's just him putting on the this facade of being kind of a a a smarmy dick and yes it does not work at all the end of the scene is him getting a list of everything of all the fancy cars in the warehouse of this dealership i hope those cars match up to all the cars they got to steal apparently they do and we'll get to it in a minute but back to our detectives they get a call from their snitch that Tumblr is coming in for new keys. He's got to jerk off with a dead hand. Right. Not what you think, but strangely worse. And the same, it's the same kind that fits the cars that are already in the impound, which Chad, if you're counting, that is our third clue for detectives Delroy Lindo and Timothy Oliphant. I, they're really putting together a case here. Yes, you are. So we leave them to go to Atlee, who has taken them to the pier where the ship is going to be loaded with cars. Mm-hmm. And then for no good reason, Angelina Jolie shows up to join the crew. Yeah, she's on a motorcycle. She's like, hey, I want to be in this movie. I got an Oscar. She actually says the line, Chad, no questions. I'm doing this for Kip. Right. Don't make me explain my motivation as a character at all. Just let me be in the movie. That is top-notch screenwriting from the script by 2000. Why is she in this movie? Oh, wait. Who cares? Tumblr finishes jerking off and shows up to pick up the keys from his informant who used to be on the tv show ellen and at this point the cops are now going to know that they have this set of three keys that are affiliated with three houses and so the cops can set up stakeouts to prevent our car thieves from stealing the three cars so far so good yes So everybody in our crew then goes to scout out all of the cars and it's here that we get this montage where each and every one is going to their respective locations and everybody's carrying walkie talkies and they start asking each other TV trivia all about cars. And at one point in the conversation, as they're asking questions, Tumblr, remember the guy who masturbates with his own dead hand, he says, hey, on Magnum P.I. wasn't Robin, that faggy guy who hung out with 
with him. And Nicolas Cage says, no, that was Higgins. Begging the question. I don't know what to say to all of this. First off, Higgins was not gay. He was British. <laughs> common, common mistake. And we are, what, five years away from Tom Hanks winning an Oscar for his portrayal of a gay man in Philadelphia when this film came out. Didn't anyone associated with the production of this film have the decency to raise their hand and say maybe we should remove this line from the film who was gonna jerry bruckheimer was he gonna be the arbiter of good taste there I, that seems like a push my, my next note is this Bo. this movie is so boring everything about this film should be a heist film a car chase film suspense action it is void of all of that it's just a bunch of jibber jabber and yam yam and nothing going on Yes. So as they're scouting all these cars, we do get a couple of pieces of, of information here. We learn that Lindo, uh, uh, Detective Stellar Lindo and Timothy Oliphant have trailed Tumblr to the garage and they've gotten a glimpse of our crew. So they're kind of on the hunt now. They're like, oh, I, looking through this door, I can see there's Memphis Reigns, there's Robert Duvall, et cetera, et cetera. Like these, this, these guys are, have a symbol to steal cars also we get the introduction of the the real eleanor of this movie mm -hmm. where nicholas cage shows up in this parking lot to just talk to it for a minute like a crazy person this is the nicholas cage i know and love where he's like all right look i know we've had some differences we've had some rough times eleanor but i think you and i are gonna get along just fine this time okay uh, Chief McBride is explaining like this is his unicorn that every time he tries to to boost a, a 67 Shelby GT something goes wrong and then Freb uh, who is just there to take pictures of the license plate does so and they take off right Nicholas Cage and Kip are now driving along together as you would do when you had nothing else better to do with a TikTok time frame to get your shit done before your younger brother gets murdered and as they're cruising along Master P shows up with his crew of thugs and they start shooting up the car that Nicholas Cage and Kip are in and Nicholas Cage and Kip they just jump out and they run off on foot through a nearby neighborhood again in a movie that is supposed to be about fast cars this movie devolves into a foot race that's more like the nighttime version of the ferris bueller finale and kip and nicholas cage they escape and they find themselves in a diner where there are a couple of cops inside having a meal and master p and his crew show up outside the diner nicholas cage and his brother inside the diner where we hear nicholas cage scream out at the top of his lungs there are cops in here and i I am safe as long as I stay in here. All right? This is safe. All right? No tagging in the diner with the cops that are right here at this booth. You see them? I'm standing right here. My balls are practically sitting on their table. These cops here, we're safe. Have a modicum of discretion, Nicolas Cage. He is not a very good criminal. No. He's a good driver. Kip goes outside at this scene, and he attaches a long cable to the front axle of Master P's car while Nicolas Cage is inside the diner, and Nicolas Cage is talking to some truck driver, and the truck driver's got this big rig. He goes outside, and the cable, if you can believe it, Bo, it's actually attached to the big truck that the truck driver drives, and the truck driver pulls off and it rips off the front axle of Master P's car and then the two cops run outside and see that Master P and his crew are holding highly illegal guns and so they're under arrest and most likely they are not going to appear in the rest of our movie which they don't <laughs> that's correct why is any of this in this film why is Master P in this movie none of this is necessary yes th this is all filler no killer I have no idea but so we move away from this nothing you want to waste some more time let's talk about the next scene that doesn't matter at all oh yeah so freb shows up with a car he stole that's not on the list right not and cage is giving him the business like hey if we're committing crimes we're doing it for a reason it turns out there's a bunch of heroin in the trunk of this cadillac that he stole which is the throwback to the original movie where the same thing happens they steal a car but it's not part of the 48 it's a scene earlier in the movie before that happens so they're right kind of mashing up the two cage tells him take this car back where you found it 
And before that can happen, there's a bit of a tussle and a bunch of heroin spills onto the floor of the garage, which is notable because now Detective Delroy Lindo shows up and they're very quickly like stashing the heroin in the trunk and, and hiding all their crime plans that they've got littering the garage. He comes in, he's like, well, 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 look at all these fucking criminals. What are you all doing together? And Nicolas Cage is like, no, it's not what you think. We're just having kind of a reunion of sorts and Delroy Lindo then starts asking hey I you know I see that you're restoring some cars but why on earth who on earth would want to restore a 1983 Cadillac Eldorado and Robert Duvall is like oh I think it's you know sentimental value or something Delroy Lindo is like all right all right let me uh let me just call the tag in so they call the he calls the plate in and they run it and it's like hey the car's clean it hasn't been reported stolen yet right and so Nicolas Cage is like hey why don't you get in and try it out what you think I just stripped this thing or something and he's like all right I'll you know I'll give it a shot and he gets in and he starts revving up the engine Detective Delroy Lindo does and unwittingly as he's revving the engine it's blowing exhaust which is blowing away the pile of heroin that didn't seem like that big a deal in the first place Mm -hmm. and then they got away scot-free i guess when anyone could have just bent down and swiped it away or something i don't know why this was a big deal but anywho in the original movie this scene is much better it's actually funny in the the original it's funny and it kind of serves purpose in this if you've seen the original you maybe acknowledge that they're paying homage to that in this movie if you haven't seen the original it's just a colossal waste of time yeah no he actually like delroy lindo is just like guess nothing is wrong here catch you later nicholas cage and then he leaves yeah done and done so but when he gets back in his car detective delroy lindo tells detective timothy oliphant it's definitely happening because i saw a note inside that had all the call signs of the cops working that night so he didn't find i mean that's I guess clue number four. I, you know, at this point, like, everyone has told them exactly what's happening they just aren't putting it together right so meanwhile inside Nicolas Cage is like look all of your decision making privileges have been taken away the cops are on us if they see something weird they're gonna bust us all so if you see anything if you see any strange cars or anything out there walk away and also get rid of this goddamn car he reads everyone the riot act and now we are off to the races Chad it is time for action finally I guess because we see Nicolas Cage unfurling his old school leather duds that he wears when he steals cars. This movie is so boring. Nicolas Cage then uh, he's surrounded by all of his car thieving friends and he looks over at Donnie the car instructing jackass. He looks over at Donnie and he says hey play low rider and so Donnie hits play on this boombox and low rider starts playing And everybody just goes into this trance to get ready for their barrage of car stealing. And it's at this point in the movie that Nicolas Cage goes full on Nicolas Cage and then just embraces the craziness that you expect from Nicolas Cage. There's a lot of, whoa, yeah, let's do this. It's this thing where, like, you've probably seen memes of this before where it's him kind of like shaking his hands and then snapping them. And he says, let's ride. This is quality Nicolas Cage. This is what I came for. We get this montage of random characters starting to steal cars. And you don't really know who these people are, or what they're doing. It's just one person we kind of know, followed by another person we sort of know, all stealing random automobiles here and there. It's really poor filmmaking at its best. And I have no idea what Angelina Jolie is good at doing in this movie, but she does that and she steals a car. Maybe she monkeys with an engine or an ignition it's just a bunch of shit that happens there's like vroom vroom and then one by one the crew starts stealing cars and then at one of the houses it's here that we see detective delray lindo and detective timothy oliphant and they are on stakeout at one of the three houses associated with the keys that they were tipped off to and some minivan pulls in front of their field division so they have to move their surveillance van around we cut back to donnie and ferb they're stealing a car then 
we see Mirror Man stealing a car. I think he's at a casino or something. Yeah, that seems right. He get he gets a car from the head doctor from Scrubs. We come back to Donnie, who then beats up a carjacker who tries to steal the car that he just stole. Then we cut to Nicolas Cage and Angelina Jolie, and they're stealing a car from like a burger joint, and that's a thing. And then one by one, the crew just starts stealing each of the 50 cars. And I gotta tell you, it's incredibly boring. It's not cool because one of the things that I, I thought was neat about the original movie is when you first see the first car being stolen or being kind of processed of like oh we're taking the the bin number off and you're and the main character is sort of explaining here's what we're doing with these cars and you know essentially swapping the bin numbers and so forth until they're considered clean restoring them however much they need to be and then selling them and you know <laughs> profit it was kind of neat to see that process happening in the movie whereas this it's just kind of like they've got little gadgets and doodads and it's turning off alarms and they're clipping wires no one has ever said like this car is incredibly tough to steal because it's got this kind of alarm so we need this kind of tool and we've got to clip this thing at exactly the right time like there's no tension or drama to any of it it's just shit that happens if anything a little bit later they completely undermine the tension with wacky jokes and light-hearted tomfoolery even that isn't goofy enough like it, there is a, a way to make this movie almost a comedy but it's not that it's quippy but it's not funny it's scriptbot 2000's best work man scriptbot 2000 read all of the collected works of shane black it can replicate it to 40 percent precision scriptbot 2000 would like more cocaine to continue <laughs> we finally cut over to uh detective delray lindo and detective timothy oliphant and they see nicholas cage coming up to steal the car that they are surveilling and nicholas cage gets wise and he walks away from the car and he reaches out to his fellow car thieves and he says step away from the cars they're dirty dirty girls <laughs> i like that and so donnie who's getting ready to steal steal one car he walks away and so we're now going to be three short of the cars that were attached to the the three keys that were provided to them and so delroy lindo is pissed because they walked away from the cars and and uh they weren't able to to arrest them in the middle of, of the thefts and the whole deal was that nicholas cage had noticed that the minivan that delroy lindo and timothy oliphant were in was in uh was two doors down the night before Right. Cage orders everybody back to the garage where Toby and Robert Duvall are, are talking about the keys from the previous boost. You know, he's like, oh, yeah, well, we've still got those keys so we have the keys to the mercedes we need we just don't have the cars mm -hmm. they hear arguing outside where nicholas cage is confronting tumblr about like hey those keys you got us were dirty detective delroy lindo knew what we were doing he must have flipped a guy at the dealership and you know tumblr's like how am i supposed to know that man and like i you know he put the squeeze on him i guess that's where they uh, I, I think it's Kip who proposes like, well, we, we steal the Mercedes we were, we stole in the first place. And everybody's like, that's stupid. And then Nicolas Cage is like, that's stupid enough to work. Yeah. And so that's the deal is they're going, the, the cars that got impounded that Kip stole, they're going to break into the impound, steal those cars back essentially from the police. In the meantime, though, Chad, some real comedy from Scriptbot 2000 has occurred. Scriptbot 2000. One thing that always makes Chad laugh dogs shitting yeah so what like robert duvall's dog has eaten these mercedes keys it's a full-size mastiff right it ate the keys because they were next to hamburgers or whatever uh, he just ate they ate this bag of keys somebody says like how are we gonna get the keys out and vinnie jones just grabs a knife and starts making for the dog uh -huh. and nicholas cage kind of dismissively is like no nah, it's cool sphinx we're gonna go a different way with this <laughs> That's what they should have done. And I love dogs. I appreciate the initiative of cutting this dog open scrote to throat, <laughs> Sphinx. I appreciate that. You you're you got a real go-getter spirit going on there, Sphinx. But instead, we're just going to let this thing shit these keys out, which is the plan. Yeah. Nicholas Cage says, go get some X-Lax and a few cans of Alpo. We're going to make this dog shit. Oh, my God. Script by 2000. You've 
You've done it again. <laughs> Kip and Tumblr steal a limo from a casino. And then our detectives start shaking down their contact to get more information on the movie. And then we cut to Nicolas Cage and Angelina Jolie. And they're stealing a car by removing the steering wheel and replacing it with another steering wheel. And then Nicolas Cage calls over the walkie talkie. And he's like, we have six hours to finish this job. Has that dog shit yet? And Nicolas Cage and Angelina Jolie, they're driving around and they start sharing sexy old stories about one another. And Angelina Jolie uh, starts talking about her pink panties, which means Bo, we are three for three when it comes to pink underwear being mentioned in a movie this season. That's really something to be proud of. Uh, the, the pink panty awards are, are rare. <laughs> we get to Nicolas Cage and Angelina Jolie. And this time they're stealing a car from this rich guy outside of his house. And inside the house, they can see that he's getting ready to fuck his girlfriend and Nicolas Cage and Angelina Jolie, as they're watching this rich guy and his girlfriend about to have sex, our hero and heroine, they start discussing their personal history and how they broke up. And, uh, nobody really cares about any of this. Yeah. And up in the house, we see this rich guy and he he's uh now fucking his girlfriend and then we cut to some old white guy cop just breaking the balls of detective timothy oliphant and detective delray lindo for snooping around files related to the carpenter who is our villain in the movie that we haven't seen for well over 50 minutes and he's a murder detective and is telling them like hey we're building we've we've spent two years building this murder case we're gonna take down calitri you guys hands off him if you want to bust him uh or bust your car thieves that's fine but we're gonna get this guy for murder not as he puts it grabs that scene is not necessary in this movie let's cut back to nicholas cage and angelina <laughs> jolie watching these rich people fuck while they're still in their car and angelina jolie asks nicholas cage what's more exciting having sex or stealing cars he's like what about having sex while boosting cars and she's like, oh, well, I hadn't thought about that. Script by 2000, always thinking outside of the box. If Script Bot 2000 had an arm, it would pat itself on the back. If Script Bot 2000 had another arm <laughs> and a dick, it would sit on its hand and then masturbate 15 to 20 minutes later. Ha ha, ha ha, ha ha. I've got to get that on paper. That's gold. As they're making out, Nicolas Cage just starts reciting car parts to her. I don't know. And he's like, oh, throttle linkage and shifter. <laughs> they, they're they about to fuck. <laughs> then Angelina Jolie notices that the couple uh, that would have seen them steal the car, presumably, have gone to the bedroom. She leaves them all blue balled in the driver's seat. And she's like, let's go get this car. Right. And he goes brakes also brakes real good brakes because i had a raging heart on because of all her sexy car talk and then she just left me in the cold not the sexy car talk where you ask questions to two boston gentlemen but real sexy car talk <laughs> where you say things like throttle bearings gear shifter and you got angelina jolie rubbing her puss over your pants don't drive like my brother don't drive like my brother <laughs> oh those guys are gems i think they're dead uh, are they both dead at least one of them's dead oh that's terrible when you're laughing at them on npr on the weekends you're laughing at a dead guy you inconsiderate <sighs> assholes well yeah, but by that token like you know should i stop laughing at jackie gleason or start laughing at jackie gleason <laughs> So, uh, by the way, Freb and Toby are out walking this fucking dog trying to get to shit. <laughs> Just a real thing that happens in this movie. There are characters waiting for a dog to shit. That is the height of tension in this film. Waiting for a dog to just pinch one off. In this action movie, we are once again waiting for a dog to shit. And Michael Pena shows up. And uh, is like, hey, S.A.'s, get off my turf. And you're like, Michael Pena, I know what you sound like. That's not what you sound like. He was in Ant-Man. Ant-Man, yeah. He was in The Martian. Yeah. Michael Pena's great. He doesn't sound like that. Orale vato. One plus one. <laughs> Tic-tac-toe. Everything goes back to stand and deliver. Every Latino impression is just... <laughs> 
<laughs> just the worst. Anyway, so he sees, like, Frev is like, oh my god, the dog's shitting, and just d- <laughs> dives his hands into it, as you do. Like, it's, you know, Triceratops poop. Uh, he starts sifting through it, and Michael Pena is like, oh, what plus one? It's a That's disgusting. Let's get out of here. This is terrible. And that's the whole scene. Michael Pena gets grossed out by them playing with shit, and then he leaves. They didn't need to have the dog shitting. They should have had her like, hey, we've got three other keys. Let's go get those cars. Okay. And just go do that. This movie could have been 30 minutes shorter and 10% better. This movie would be a crisp 90 minutes. If it were an hour to get to half an hour of action, now you got some. But an hour and a half to get to 30 minutes of action? Fuck you. Well, that's what the original is. It's 45 50 minutes of just weirdness and then you get 40 minutes of non-stop insanity right that's what this movie should have been and kind of what it aims to be in a weird way it fails it fails but it, it, you can see the dna there but so now we're at six hours till the deadline at the impound uh guard at the impound who looks suspiciously like louis ck today yes is interrupted by mirror man who distracts him by demanding his volvo while the rest of the crew is breaking into the impound through the fence Uh mirror man at one point the guard is about to look back at the cctv you know where he would presumably see them breaking into the impound but mirror man says yo man look at this and then he may he pulls a doll out of his jacket yeah it's a black barbie doll and makes it dance but what song does it sing oh i I don't remember what was the song it's brick house oh right so this this leads to this question chad (laughs) was mirror man's plan like i've got a plan b if he goes for the cameras i got this doll in my jacket whoa whoa, whoa. let me stop you there mirror man did you bring the doll for this or did you just happen to have a doll in your jacket because that's gonna lead to some follow-ups i think he brought it for this that this was his plan like if if push comes to shove i'm gonna pull out this black barbie doll and i'm gonna make it dance around on the counter and i'm gonna sing brick house because who doesn't love that that's fucking crazy chad that is maybe the craziest thing in this crazy ass movie detective delroy lindo is at the office and gets a note saying hey those light fragments you found were black light fragments yeah those black light fragments were black light fragments right like oh, jesus christ you you're god bless you don't worry lindo i love you to death but you're a shitty detective and <laughs> he would make a hell of a batman yeah he would so detective delaware lindo then tells detective timothy oliphant like hey you need to come with me so they go to the original crime scene where the you know they they originally got the three mercedes he then proceeds to wax nostalgic about black lights for a minute mm-hmm. telling the evolution of black lights through the 70s and shit right and he's like oh god who was coming up here oh oh wait here look it's all those car license plate numbers and what are all these speckled stains over here on the wall oh my god was somebody pulling a stranger that's my move don't don't let anyone tell you different (laughs) they say well we can't possibly track all these cars like if they're trying to steal 50 cars we can't do that and delroy lindo says we don't have to we're gonna pick the rarest ones and we're gonna stake those out and he picks eleanor right the gt mustang and he says, um, and when Timothy Oliphant is like, well, why that one? And he says, because Nicolas Cage is afraid of that one. He's going to save that one for last. So now we're at three hours until deadline, Chad. Kip and Toby and Tumblr are stealing another car. And they, they get in through like a, a fake garage door code. There's a pool party happening behind the house as they're in this garage. Yeah, a bunch of rich white people having a pool party. So while Kip and Tumblr are stealing the car, Toby is kind of looking out. And then this girl from the pool party walks in and is like, hey, what are you doing in here? And then sees Kip and Tumblr. And and then she's like, oh my God, everyone, oh my God, they're stealing your car. She says, call security. Right. Not call the police, call security. Neighborhood security in California, I'm sure. Oh my God, could you imagine? Right. Fuck 
So, yeah, a real fancy pants neighborhood. Toby jumps in the back of the car. They drive off. Then we leave that because we don't want to have a potentially exciting scene. No, no, no. You wouldn't want to do that. So we cut to Mirror Man and Sphinx who are robbing a car with the word snake on the license plate. And it's like a big Range Rover kind of Jeep looking thing. Yeah. Mirror Man uh, has a joke here. He's like, ah, look, snake's on his license plate. He's going to have to slither his ass to the bus stop tomorrow. (laughs) Scribba 2000. That's a zinger. Then we see some cops pulling up to a guard shack at at this lot because they're like, hey, we need to check this lot. We were given this plate number. We need to make sure the car is okay. And Vinny and Mirror Man are descending this parking lot as the police are ascending this kind of spiral parking structure. And in the meantime, a snake is actually in the car. Wait, the car that had snake on the license plate has a snake inside of it that's right and so mirror man is like what is this reggie i hate snakes i hate them and uh vinnie uh jones or uh sphinx of course doesn't say anything but runs kind of head first into the cops who are coming up this ramp right and uses the power of the range rover to basically just drive them off a ramp and wreck their car none of this matters it doesn't it's just stuff that happens in the movie and it's 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 a weird movie to kind of synopsize because it's like here's the thing that happens it doesn't really add up to anything it doesn't connect to anything it's just a thing now we're at two hours until the deadline Uh oh. and we're at the pier where we see Julian Jolie dropping off uh, a car Atlee is there and he says hey we're at 48 now we only need two more cars by the way Sphinx and Mirror Man are on their way to the garage that's 49 but we haven't heard from Tumblr and Kip well let me interject a little patented pick six movies fan fiction please here's how you make this shit better you go in you set it up and you know they stake out the cars whatever but when they start stealing cars you just show a montage of them stealing each car one by one do you know what I mean? Like you're stealing it from the rich debutante. You're stealing this car from a dealer. You're stealing this one here. And each of the moments where you see a car getting taken, it's just kind of like reading a Bazooka Joe joke. It's beginning, middle, end. It happens very quickly. And you keep a running tally of them scratching them off the board. One by one by one by one. Where we keep seeing Eleanor one or two above, one or two below. Until we get to where like, hey guys, we have 49 out of 50. Eleanor is still out there. Hey Nick. Nicholas Cage go steal the unicorn yes but they don't do any of that shit it feels like they're trying to but it's just it's just mired in boring and detail and no one cares and it's not funny or entertaining right it's too many characters it's too much shit going on it's it, it's packed with too much bullshit when there should be five characters doing all of this right it should snap it should pop like go 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 and then as soon as they pick up a little bit of momentum it's like so kip i know that i was your brother and i had reasons that i left you you. And he's like, just fucking go, man. Yeah. This is gone in 60 seconds. I'm bored in 20 seconds. Scriptbot 2000 thinks it's unfortunate they shot the first draft. <laughs> Some notes would have been appreciated. Looking back, Scriptbot 2000 regrets the overstuffed nature of the movie. <laughs> Kip and his band of pranksters are lost in suburbia, as they put it. Like, they stole this SUV and have gotten lost. Did we mention that Toby got shot? No, well, the, it happens here because they drive past a roadblock on their way out. That's where the police shoot at him and Toby's been shot. Right, and you're like, oh my god, Toby! Who is he? Right, what does he do again? Was he one of the guys chasing the shit? And then they get to the pier and he's like, I can't believe that bitch shot me, Larry! Um, <laughs> Nicholas Cage is like, say it with me. You're going to be okay. <laughs> Will Patton is like, hey, I know where we can get this guy some private help. <laughs> and so they take him to a private like mob doctor who is, by the way, Scott Rosenberg, the writer of Gone in 60 Seconds. The real script pot 2000 is the doctor there. And Kip goes with Toby and Atley. So he's kind of out of out of the loop. Atlee tells Nicolas Cage, hey, if, you know, if something goes wrong with this last car, I'll take care of him. I'll get him out of town. So, But we are at the place that you suggested in your fan fiction where only Eleanor remains. We should have gotten here at about 75 minutes into the movie. Yes, instead of 
94. Right. Because again, we we show Eleanor on the board and then we cut to the detectives who are meeting in the fucking morning and it's like one hour till the deadline. Timothy Oliphant is like, hey, all the cars got got. The only one left is the 67 Mustang. The only one we can find on record is one in Long Beach. So we need to head out to Long Beach. So Angelina Jolie drops Nicolas Cage off at the parking lot where the Eleanor is, is held and he very easily breaks into the car and gives a little pep talk to the car again in a, another weird scene where he's like all right you treat me right and i'll treat you right i think he's crazy <laughs> so he gets the car started and is pulling out of the parking lot when he looks to his right and there's detectives delroy lindo and timothy oliphant who are pulling up to the garage so he spins out in the middle of the road and the car chase is on did you find it unsettling to see a car chase in this movie? Because the absence of them in the film so far has been a real notable element in the movie. And when it shows up, it's kind of off-putting. It's almost inappropriate. The same way if, I don't know, they started doing a song and dance number. Or maybe if a animated, anthropomorphic, cool cat character showed up to be part of the gang. You're like, why are we racing cars in this car racing movies all of a sudden? Yeah, it, it's really... It's, it's strange. Again, there's not much action in this action movie. And because I watched the original Gone in 60 Seconds before I watched this, um, it was strange because I was like, oh, I and I, I just didn't remember the end of this movie because a week from now, I will not remember having watched it. It is incredibly forgettable. But I remember thinking like, oh, this is going to be where, granted it took forever to get here, but the movie's going to kick in a gear and the rest of the movie is going to be one long action scene scene much like the original was which is not the case at all no we have this car chase which has some good stuff in it and i don't know i mean maybe the thing to do with it is just to say what we liked or didn't like about this car chase because it's just him being chased by a bunch of cops and a helicopter this is the final and as we've noted only real car chase in the entire movie that should be all about car chases and there's a lot of zoom zoom and honk and screech screech and as this car chase begins to take place there's one scene where detective timothy oliphant says geez that was close and detective delray lindo tells him to keep your pants on and i wanted to know why would he say this is that a reference to sex did detective timothy oliphant shit himself i don't know why you would say that to another person during a car chase scene i think it's one of those things like when you accidentally say the wrong thing it's the you know u2 the brian regan u2 right where it's just the inappropriate use of the phrase and just n nobody bothered to edit it out because nobody was in shit like i think this was the assembly cut of the movie <laughs> where it's just like here's everything we shot there are times during this car chase sequence that the uh, filmmakers really embrace kind of this fast and loose cinematography that is somewhat reflective of the original movie but the dialogue and the sound editing and really the overall modern means of filmmaking tends to erase any of that real quick grainy gritty style of cinema that you see in the 1974 version of this film again it is kind of inferior in every way like it doesn't feel as fun or authentic or again kind of irresponsible that's what's so fun about the first one is it just feels dangerous it feels like somebody who could really get hurt yes at one point in this movie nicholas cage spins eleanor around backward and he's driving very fast in reverse and he is alongside a normal person's car that's going forward down the road as one normally drives a car and in this scene nicholas cage looks over and he sees a kid in the back seat of the normal car which is going forward as he's going backwards and since Nicolas Cage is headed in reverse at the same rate of speed, Nicolas Cage and this child share a smile and they create a memory that will last a lifetime. And this is just really an example of how the tone of this film is all over the place because there is no reason to toss in a joke here because you're questioning, is this a serious car chase? What are the high stakes? Nicolas Cage's younger brother is going to be murdered if he does not arrive on time. And at this point in the film... It's like, hey, let's kind of have a wink and a smile. None of this really matters at all. <laughs> that is 100% correct. 
and he gets chased by some more patrol cars he uh takes him into the la river can we talk about the bus that t-bones the police car that would most certainly kill any human being in that vehicle behind the wheel but then the cop just gets out and brushes off his pants like whoa that was a close one i almost died glad i didn't that is the first of like six times the most fucked up vehicular thing possible could happen in front of detectives del Lindo and timothy oliphant right the cop gets hit by the bus here mm-hmm. which hangs him up for a little bit later there is that crazy fucking jump there is a car being shoved through a wall at him i mean it's just left and right these guys are dodging death and uh so a helicopter shows up which I only mentioned because it's referred to as Air One right uh in the movie and i was like they should have just called it Airwolf. i think the helicopter shows up after nicholas cage gets three stars right that's right um at five stars that's where they bring out the tanks so cut away from the action scene because let's not get too crazy uh-huh and at lee aka will Patton, is telling kip you know like hey i gotta get you out of town and kip's like hey i'm not my brother i don't abandon my friends Boy, you think that's what happened to your your brother? You think he abandoned you? It, my favorite part of this, and it's a real, again, I'm a real Will Patton fan. And it's his delivery of like, like the whole reason he left town is because your mother asked him to because she was afraid you were going to follow in his footsteps and you'd end up joining his crew. So he gave up everything. And then he goes, six years later, you're a boost anyway. How about that? As a Will Patton head, that does my heart good. Nicolas Cage didn't leave town. He got a job working at a go-kart track with a pedophile. <laughs> yeah. Like, he's 15 minutes away. Yeah, I don't think he's claiming any income tax or anything. No, he is. <laughs> it's a cash-only business. He's living real off the grid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that place is referral only. Right. So we're 25 minutes to our deadline. And Nicolas Cage is being chased around by the cops, you know, playing a little cat and mouse with them. And there's a moment where the Mustang's engine starts to falter. And he's like, oh, no, baby, don't do this to me now and the car stalls and he's like oh no 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 look baby i'll do anything you want just stick with me and finally the engine turns over and he gets the car started just in time to alert the police to his presence apparently right and smash off his rearview mirror yeah so the chase is on again he goes to a shipyard this time where he's being chased by a bunch of cops including of course our detectives a big air tank Mm -hmm. gets punctured and starts bouncing around and knocking in a shit and Mm -hmm. big storage containers and police cars and it's uh it's kind of like the end of freddy versus jason where uh jason was using the air tanks or freddy which one i don't, one of them was using the air tanks the air scuba tanks at camp crystal lake to fire uh little torpedoes at the other that happened in that movie you say so this is the scene where a police pickup truck gets clobbered by a wrecking ball that just comes swinging by and slams this truck through the wall of a building. That is the best thing that happens in this whole movie. Absolutely. It is. Even my note is like, that was pretty sweet, which is the 14 year old in me being like, that was pretty sweet. But then the movie just grinds to a halt while detective Timothy Oliphant gets out of the car to, you know, kind of lighten up the mood. And he runs over to this driver who is miraculously not not dead and he says you okay buddy are you sure because man you just went through a wall hey man i don't know if you noticed but you got hit by a big ass wrecking ball man we're just having fun here right none of this really matters no one's gonna die there's no real danger no everybody's fine toby's (sighs) fine everybody's fine the movie gives us a time check here we got four minutes to deliver this final car and Nicolas cage makes his way over to the vincent thomas bridge where for gosh don don bo there's an accident blocking Blocking his path. Yeah, so he he hits reverse, like he's gonna get off the bridge, find a way around, I suppose. Then it, the cops are hot on his trail. They kind of stop behind him, block the road, get out with their guns drawn. Right. So he is between Scylla and Charybdis, as they say, Chad, and he decides I'm gonna go for it and slams on the pedal and is gone in 60 seconds, Chad. You know, he ends up uh, hitting the back of a trailer like that is, you know, they're gonna. Look 
load one of these wrecked cars onto and he just magically sails for hundreds of feet over this entire multi-car accident and uh, emergency vehicles and it looks like shit this looks like an automotive version of free willy (laughs) it is embarrassingly fake like the whole movie really shows real cars throughout all of the chase scenes this finale is thoroughly cgi but it's the year 2000 cgi it looks awful yeah it's way more exciting to see the guys who stole cameron's dad's car in ferris bueller which is the second time that movie's been referenced tonight back at the garage the crew's all nervous where's nicholas cage angelina jolie is actually crying i think she's sad because she's not going to get paid for her time stealing these cars or being in this movie I once guess. they cut the rest of her part out the phone rings and it's the carpenter and he's calling up to atley our crew elder and he says yo one car short boy oh bring the kid and we're gonna settle up remember me i'm in this movie too <laughs> <laughs> then will Patton is like funniest thing that kid gave me the slip he just ran off saw him in the distance just like an old cowpoke riding over the horizon and then the, the carpenter says then get me nicholas cage i'll kill one of them i don't care i don't know why he has a scottish yeah. accent one but- rains as good <laughs> as another it never rains but it pours he says that. Uh-huh. He sure does. The Scriptbot 2000 wrote that. It is a weather analogy. It'll sound good because he'll be British. No one had the decency, nay the moral fortitude to, to say this doesn't make any sense. It's just embarrassing for you and me and the audience to hear those words. So Nicolas Cage, un- unwittingly, he doesn't know anything about this deal. Will Patton tells Skip like, well, it looks like your brother's going to take your place in the guillotine. He says, Nicholas Cage, sure enough, goes straight to Kalitri's junkyard castle. Slash wood shop slash wood shop. Right. It looks like the kind of place like Muppet monsters would live. And Kalitri like meets him outside and he's like, oh, this car, it's seen better days, Sonny. Again, I don't know why this has turned. Just keep, just go with it. And Nicolas Cage is like, hey, you know, just, it's a fixer upper. Look, man, I did it with 12 minutes over time, but what are you going to do? Traffic. Am I right? And he's like, I ask for 50 cars, not 49 and a half, you wee bastard. And Nicolas Cage is like wanders around the Eleanor and is like, all right, all right, let's say this is what, 60, 70, eighty thousand dollars so you subtract that from two hundred thousand dollars right that's a hundred thousand twenty dollars and Kalitri is like you got to deal laddie and he's like great right that was easy so we're cool and he's like cool as a cucumber laddie he's like why are you saying it all menacing like that <laughs> Don't worry your wee head about it. Everything's fine. We're finished. Again, you're, what you're saying sounds great, but the way you're saying is kind of throwing me for a loop. <laughs> then Kalitri just clocks him in the fucking face. With brass knuckles. Yeah, just crushes him and is like, no one insults me. No one puts a gun to my head. Kill him and shred his car. But when I was growing up, there were two pairs of brass knuckles in my home. And one of them was like a set that you would buy at a, like an army surplus store, you know, from the glass case up front. And then there was this other pair that was clearly something made in high school metal shop, <laughs> you know? And like the first one was smooth to the touch on your palm and your fingers. And the second one would honestly do as much damage to the hand of the person <laughs> using it as it would to the person receiving it you know when i masturbate chad i wear brass knuckles and i call it the brass monkey shuffle that's my move i'm gonna file that one away for later Uh uh-huh the carpenter in this scene says all right boys we're gonna take care of business and it's about this time that detective delray lindo and detective timothy oliphant they just show up to make their way into the finale of our film they find their way into the carpenter's hideout at this wrecking yard and then two thugs take nicholas cage 
out to the yard where they're going to shoot him in the head or the chest, depending upon which one he chooses. And then Atle shows up and he screams out, no, no, no. Hey guys, you're doing it wrong. And they're like, huh? At this point, our movie turns into the finale of Toy Story 3. And it's here that we see <laughs> Kip swinging a big piece of heavy machinery that has a claw on the end of it. And it knocks the bad guys out of the movie. And he has now saved his brother kind of sort of but not really yeah it, that was definitely one of those times in the film where it was like he knows how to drive one of those okay nicholas cage then goes back inside the carpenter's wood shop and nicholas cage walks in and just starts kicking the shit out of the carpenter and then nicholas cage picks up this wooden it looks like a school desk or maybe an end table and the carpenter's just beside himself with fear that nicholas cage might destroy his wooden darling carving and then nicholas cage says oh yeah you've got a thing about wood and then the audience says oh yeah this guy has a thing about wood i forgot about that it, it's the weird kind of obsessive reaction you would see if like nicholas cage were stabbing his real doll in the tits <laughs> oh no put it down oh no that's the most <laughs> precious part nicholas cage just destroys this wooden desk thing and then the carpenter grabs a gun and starts shooting at nicholas cage and so we get a little cat and mouse through the steam tunnel slash catwalks of this building and about this time detective delray lindo and detective timothy oliphant they show up to sneak around the port of that set of the finale of this movie and at one point nicholas cage just falls through the metal flooring of the catwalks for unnecessary suspense the carpenter ends up face to face with delray lindo finally Finally, we get a mono e mono face off between two characters in our movie that have never met each other and have no history and really have no conflict and really it doesn't matter at all that they've run into one another. It's really just an excuse for Scriptbot 2000 to have Kalitri give this big baroque speech about like, oh, the day of your funeral, they'll give a 21 gun salute and it'll be the happiest day of your life. And he's about to shoot him in the fucking face. And then Nicolas Cage just high kibas out of nowhere. Mm hmm and delivers this like swinging kick that knocks Kalitri, our carpenter over a railing and into he does his best hans gruber impression he diehards falling yeah. off of this railing shooting his gun as he as, as he does so but what he does is he kind of crashes through the ceiling of his office and lands on the coffin that he made because he landed in the coffin it's not plagiarism instead it is an homage Ugh. So <laughs> it's just so bad, man. And the truly dumbest part of this movie comes next, where Nicolas Cage and Delroy Lindo are now, you know, mono e mono yet again. Delroy Lindo is just mono e Lindo with everybody. And Delroy Lindo's gun is between them. They both look at it. Delroy Lindo slowly leans down, grabs it, and says, What we got here is a real moral dilemma because you just saved my life here a minute ago. And I also understand why you're doing what you're doing, which is to save your brother. I understand that. But you have caused quite a mess. And uh, Nicolas Cage is like, whatever you decide to do, detective, I'm cool with it. <laughs> Del Lindo is just like, all right, you crazy kid, get out of here before I change my mind. And you're like, what? Yeah, he's a terrible detective. Yeah, right. He is going to be brought up on charges. Timothy Oliphant is going to see Nicolas Cage walk past him and be like, no, no, your boss said it was cool. <laughs> and... There's going to be hearings and inquiries and long meetings with his superiors. Like, he is never going to be promoted. He is going, if he's lucky, he'll be a cop six months later. <laughs> Nicholas Cage, as he leaves, he's like, hey, check out a cargo ship at Pier 19. You won't be in the movie again and it won't matter. That happens a lot in this film. Over and over again, man. You just leave a scene wondering, what was the point of that? And then you learn there wasn't one. I'll bet that snake was in the cargo container. It's dead now. Or either that or it ate some poor dock worker and has now got a taste for human flesh and is large. <laughs> and now that's the movie I want to see. A fucking man-eating snake loose on a dock? Now we got something. About eaten in 60 seconds 
Now I'm in. We cut back to the garage owned by Robert Duvall, or maybe it's someone else. I don't know. And everybody's having a good old fashioned barbecue. And all of our idiots from our car heist movie that never really happened are there. And they're all watching Angelina Jolie try to help the guy who got shot. She's cutting up his food and helping him eat it. And then Mirror Man is just shouting out from across the picnic table. Damn, sexy, sexy. Y'all, this girl's getting me horny. I'm about to do a stranger over here. <laughs> And here, because nobody asked for this, Sphinx, the character who has said not one word in this entire movie, uh, as noted earlier, he does a real silent Bob routine where he spouts off a bunch of words of wisdom during the final few frames of this film. And it's a real, if we shadows have offended, think but this and all is mended. And none of this means jack shit about anything. Just stop. Please leave this on the editing room floor. I don't give a shit about what he's jabbering about. It, it, again, it doesn't mean anything. Everybody has a good laugh. Nicholas Cage says, hey, man, I thought you were from Long Beach. <laughs> Kip comes out and says, uh, hey, brother, um, I bought you something. And so he hands his brother, Nicholas Cage, this box. He, Nicholas Cage opens it up. It's a set of keys. He's like, you bought me a car, a car. How did you know? And so they go inside and it turns out that Kip has purchased his brother a busted up version of Eleanor. And Robert Duvall's there and he's like, oh, we can get this fixed up. It's going to be great. Everyone applauds except for the audience who's looking around to make sure they haven't left anything on the floor as they prepare to leave the theater. <laughs> and Nicolas Cage gets inside the car to take it for a test drive, which is a piece of junk. As he's leaving the garage, Angelina Jolie, remember she's in this movie, she jumps in the passenger seat and she gives a real hell yeah, she wants a ride and the movie fades to black but then we hear the car engine stall and Nicolas Cage says oh don't do this to me and the movie ends on a real wah, 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 wah. I mean just thank god it's over right it just took forever to get to this fucking ending man this is not a good film. The biggest problem with this movie is that it's not wacky enough to be like entertaining in a silly way. Right. It's just tremendously dull. Like there's just not much happens in this movie. The one thing that should be exciting is stealing cars and that's not exciting. And it doesn't happen very often. Yeah. And when you see it and even the montages are so wonky, it feels like they stutter where it's like, oh, here's a little bit of a montage where we're going to see him stealing all these cars. And no, we're going to take a break to go to the detectives. And then we cut over here to do this other thing. And then kind of back to the montage. And it just felt like this whole movie was just fits and starts and characters that you couldn't care about. Who gives a shit about Tumblr? Like, did, did anybody at the end of this movie be like, you know, we just didn't spend much time with him. I, I wonder, did, was he okay? Did he land in a good place? I mean, he was at the barbecue, but how's he feeling? You know, it's a better movie than this that is car themed that has a lot of the same beats but it's just immeasurably more entertaining and suspenseful is the robert zemeckis film used cars starring kurt russell yeah you're right that is uh i didn't realize how similar it was but now that i think about it yes you gotta steal not steal but you have to procure all of these cars by a time deadline and it's just a better movie than this or hell, for that matter, what stands head and shoulders above both of those is the original 1974 version, Gone in 60 Seconds, which is horribly irresponsible and immeasurably more entertaining. You know, it, it is an indie movie from the 70s, so, you know, take, take that as you will. But, like you said, it's immensely entertaining. It, it, it The last act of that movie again is kind of shocking at times at how like holy shit that really happened you know and it's refreshing it's like a porno where you replace all of the sex with car chase scenes yeah but strangely i was aroused during both both forms that's not strange at all though huh. that's good to hear but what do we have coming up on the next episode of pick six movies hey we're not done with script bot 2000 and jerry <laughs> bruckheimer productions <laughs> We are going straight from Gone in 60 Seconds to a little movie I like to call, because it's the title, Days of Thunder. The Tom Cruise, Nicole Kidman, Robert Duvall, Tony Scott-directed summer blockbuster that is kind of shit. 
come back in two weeks or just, you know, pick up your phone or computer or wherever the hell you find this podcast and give us a listen. As always, like, rate, review. Uh, leave us a comment. You can email us at picksixmovies at gmail.com. Visit us online at picksixmovies.com. Uh, Bo, any final thoughts on the year 2000s remake of Gone in 60 Seconds? Uh, no, I never want to think about this movie again, uh, but please, uh, you if you have never seen it, you should check out the original Gone in 60 Seconds because it is a uh, what doctors call a hoot. And this one is what doctors call shit we'll see you in two weeks everybody